Yeah, okay. So good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to this uh, joint uh, webinar, uh, Women in Neurosurgery, together with the Asian Congress of Neurological Surgery Nurses. Um, actually, we are celebrating uh, Women's International Month, and we are very glad that you've all come today here to support us. We are also starting off in the Women of Neurosurgery collaboration with uh, developing countries uh, in co different continents, such as Africa, um, Central Asia, and also um, South America. So this is one of our first uh, sessions, which we are actually uh, building bridges with uh, Africa. And we are very proud to have a few of our African colleagues joining us today. Uh, to kick off the webinar, um, Prof. Katu, would you like to say something now or maybe? Oh, at the it's, end? it's fine. Just I'm very fine to see the Dr. Atul Goyal face. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so, of course, so happy. Yes. Yes. For us <laughs> women, we are very happy that, as usual, Prof. Atul is uh, here gracing uh, our webinar because he's one of strong supporters of uh, women neurosurgeons. He's actually supported a lot of us. I think Abida is here to approve of him, <laughs> of his uh, great in actually bringing her today to be one of the top neurosurgeons too. And she's actually uh, educating a lot of young neurosurgeons. So we're very proud of her. And thank you, Prof. Atul, uh, for uh, being able to uh, grace the webinar today. Um, I don't think I need to introduce Prof. Atul. He's, of course, a very famous person, all right, in the neurosurgery uh, world. He's of, uh, presently the president of the Neurosurgical Society of India. Uh, from 2018 to 2019, and the president of Cranial Vertebral Junction and Spine Society, uh, professor and head of the Department of Neurosurgery King Edward Memorial to 2021, and now the professor emeritus uh, starting from 2021 till now. Um, I think he is uh, very well known, number one in India in the field of neurosurgery and neurosciences, um, and also in his discipline, subdiscipline of skull base. And I think we all know about how uh, he's ranked highly number one also in the, the world of spine. So let's now, uh, without any further time, uh, introduce our, our Professor Atul Gol to present his topic today, Surgery in Pituitary Tumors. Okay, Sharon, <clears throat> and uh, respected dear Yoko Kato, without any doubt, she is the I don't want to say too much. She's the boss and she is the leader. And she's contributed so much to the world neurosurgery. I think, you know what? Nobody in the history of neurosurgery has contributed, in my estimation, like what she has done to the world of neurosurgery. She has gone to interior. She has gone to Africa. She has gone to poorer parts of Asia. She has trained so many Indian neurosurgeons, so many women neurosurgeons. I have no hesitation to say that there is in our generation of neurosurgeons, she will be ranked highest and highly for a great contribution, not only in neurosurgery, in technical neurosurgery, in technological neurosurgery, what she has promoted. She has shown techni techniques and technology to poorest areas of the world. And I think these contributions cannot be undermined and under-recognized. They are highly rated. And Yoko, congratulations to you with in deep heart what you have done to me, to my students, and to various people all over the world. Sharon, I hope you agree with what I said. Definitely, definitely. I, I think everyone here agrees. Uh, too much words. Thank you very much, Atul. <laughs> so without saying anything further, because uh, uh, I have been given a topic on pituitary tumors. Pituitary tumors, as we all know, is a very, very important subject in our field of neurosurgery. <clears throat> and pituitary tumors are difficult tumors. Pituitary tumor surgery is a result-oriented operation. You do good surgery, you good, give new life, you give new vision. On the other hand, there can be complications and there can be bad complications to the extent that you can kill the person. So you give good new functional life and that is the aim of pituitary tumor surgery. So I will like to take you to the world of pituitary tumors and to show you some slides of where the pituitary gland is located. You see, by the side of cavernous sinus, by the side of carotid artery, underneath the chiasma, over the sphenoid sinus, 
in the vicinity of paranasal sinuses. So all these uh, areas, so we cannot call pituitary gland extracranial, we cannot call it intracranial. It is a special location of this gland. And uh, I don't want to go too much in this, but this location has great functional implications. The temperature regulation, understanding what is happening outside, understanding what is happening inside through the carotid arteries, and then this information pituitary gland gets, and then this, this master gland relays this information all over the body and master gland functions. So this location is not a function, not a anatomical error, but a functional necessity. Why this is located nor intracranial nor extracranial in this special group is a very important subject which we can discuss at some other time. So this is a saddle shaped area of uh, sphenoid sinus where the pituitary gland is located. And this is the diaphragm, you see very strong diaphragm. And there is a hole in the diaphragm from where the pituitary stalk comes out. So this hole in the diaphragm is a very important hole and I will uh, discuss the implications of this hole in the diaphragm. And if you see the anatomy from below, you see this is the pituitary gland, very beautiful relationship with the carotid artery. And the, this part of the carotid, the, you know, as it enters into the cavernous sinus, this part is in relationship to the pituitary gland. Here, the artery is a little bit lateral. So when you are going into cavernous sinus, you have to remember that you can enter into this area. There is some space for you to enter into cavernous sinus. No, needless to say, anatomy of uh, this area has to be understood very nicely and very perfectly if you have to do good operations in this area. So over the several years, I have written several articles on pituitary glands and uh, some of these articles relate to giant pituitary tumor, giant. So I will show you the some giant pituitary tumors and take you to the world of giants very soon. And uh, these are some of my articles which you will like to read. So giant pituitary tumors by itself is a big clinical entity. Giant tumors does not mean malignant. Giant, even when they become giant, they remain benign. So the implications of surgery are very critical. We know about Cushing disease. If you do a good Cushing disease, you can good give new life. And if you do partial resection and wait for radiation and other drugs, this boy may not live for more than six months. So from six months, you give full life. So such an important surgery for Cushing disease, I think how to do and how beautifully you remove the tumor will decide the life of this person. So this is the nodule. And we have now understood very clearly that you have to remove the whole nodule, complete nodule, and you have to come around the Humor, and that is the best way to remove. Sometimes there are diagnostic dilemmas that we have to uh, understand this may not indeed be pituitary tumor. This may be some other clinical entity. I am talking of giants and this is my favorite slide. I have been showing this slide for at least 20 years now. Tumors in the skull base can look like real, real lion and they can be ferocious like lion but we have to make them look like a flower if we can understand them properly. So India is well known for large tumors. I do not know why is this special, maybe under-recognized, under-treated, difficult to get treatment. And Dr. Kawase had organized one meeting at the foothill of Mount Fuji on meningiomas. He was the president of meningioma society. During that meeting, I presented this case of meningioma I told Dr. Kawase that Dr. Kawase, my meningiomas are bigger than Mount Fuji. And, uh, but you know, even if they become large, they do not become aggressive or malignant. So we have to understand that radical dissection can lead to reasonable clinical outcome. So I want you to see some of these pituitary tumors, which are large, which can be quite massive, and they can go behind the cella, go above, get into the cavernous sinus, 
and have various kinds of consistencies and necrosis. You see how the tumor is growing. This is another huge tumor. You see this. And most of these tumors can be diagnosed on radiology, on MRI, that this is a pituitary tumor. This is not some other kind of malignancy or something like that. And as I mentioned to you, many of these large tumors, they look giant, they are aggressive, they are huge, but they remain benign. So the question is, you have to understand how these tumors arise and how these tumors grow and what are the relationship with the carotid artery, with the various arteries of circle of villus, with the dura, I call it mother dura, dura matter, or mother dura. You see these tumors. So there is an aggression and various types of massivity can be seen in, on various occasions. So giant pituitary tumors in, is itself a weight on the patient's head. And also I have to tell you, it is a weight on doctor's head. If you treat these patients, many of these giant tumors are non-functioning tumors. They come with only visual deficit. You give them, you remove it properly, you cure them because they are benign histologically. You may not need radiation. So I will like to show you how these tumors grow. Now you see this is a large tumor and it is, you know, one thing we described and which is extremely important in understanding of giant pituitary tumor is as it grows, it takes the dura of the diaphragm cell. So this whole tumor is covered by dura and there is dura here. So the whole thing is interdural. You see, this is diaphragm. It is not subarachnoid. You know, I showed you that picture of hole in the diaphragm, but this hole does not become valid when the tumor becomes big. The whole of diaphragm dura or dura mother covers the tumor. This understanding is very, very critical. You see here how the dura gets elevated. I am quite sure and convinced that if you do not understand this dural based anatomy of these tumors, you cannot remove this tumor. You see the dura gets elevated, the dura gets elevated, the whole tumor is inside the dural confines. You see there is dural cover around the tumor. There is dura around the tumor and it is very important to know that there is no hole in the dura here. The tumor does not come out of the hole of the diaphragm cell. And these tumors, which do not involve the cavernous sinus, but they grow upwards and under the diaphragm, I like to call them grade one, when they are not involving the cavernous sinus. I have been talking about this classification for a very long time, but still I have a feeling that not many people have understood what I want to say. So it is an opportunity for me again, that I relay these thoughts, which I feel are absolutely critical. You see, this is covered, the dura covers the tumor here and the dura covers the tumor here. So there is no artery of circle of villus inside the tumor. If you do not have this understanding that the whole tumor is within the dura, it may be very difficult for you to remove this tumor. If you think that this is in the subarachnoid space, if it is in subarachnoid space, then you need to do dissection of the arteries and all. Then you need to come transcranial. But if you think that this is dural cover, then you can take an incision in anterior dural cover, break the tumor. Many of these tumors are very soft and cystic and necrotic, and they grow up. They grow and they are covered by dura. This interdural location is so critically important. When the cavernous sinus carotid artery is covered on both sides by the tumor, it is cavernous sinus invasion. Here it is not covering both sides, it is covering just one side. So it is not cavernous sinus. So this tumor is having a complete dural cover and it is that is very critical. So this tumor, you see it is growing so big and it is this artery is on the dome of the tumor, not inside the tumor. This nubbin that you are seeing, this small little nubbin, it is not, it is intracranial, but it is subdural or interdural in location. This tumor, you see this nubbin, 
If you have a feeling that this is intracranial and subarachnoid, then you cannot remove this tumor. But if you know that there is a dural cover to this tumor, then these tumors become quite straightforward and simple surgical procedure. And as I have told you that if you do good operation, you good, good new life to the person. On the other hand, if you do them wrongly or badly, you can kill these patients because they are vascular tumors, they are soft tumors, but they can bleed and there can this bleeding can be an issue. You see this covered by dura. There is no never an artery inside the tumor in grade one tumors. You see this tumor becoming so big beyond the corpus callosum, but it is covered by dura, the whole thing. And this nubbin is also interdural. So this is my gradation of pituitary tumors. When the tumor elevates the diaphragm cellae, it is grade one. When it goes into the cavernous sinus, it encases the carotid artery, it is grade two. The diaphragm is elevated here. The diaphragm is, the lateral wall is here. The tumor has entered into cavernous sinus. This is grade two. Grade three is when the tumor elevates the roof of the cavernous sinus. You see the roof of the cavernous sinus is elevated. This is also dura. So the, when it elevates the roof of cavernous sinus, it is grade two. This is diaphragm. The whole thing is interdural. Grade four, I call it when they do not respect mothers and they go and transgress the dura, they go into the subarachnoid space. I call them grade three p 2 t tumors. So my understanding is this anatomical and surgical understanding of p 2 t tumors on dura has great implications in the surgery of p 2 t tumors. You see, when the tumor comes subcranial, subfrontal like this, if you understand that dura is still there, otherwise these kind of tumors were always done transcranial about 20 years ago. This remains under the dura, this remains under the dura, and this can come from the nose, break the tumor, learn the art of breaking the tumor, and the whole diaphragm cell will ultimately fall into your view. This is grade one tumor. You see how it goes in front. There is no artery inside the tumor. You see many, there is necrosis in the tumor. You just remove the anterior wall. There is no need to remove the tuberculum cellae or planum spinarium. Remove this anterior wall, break the tumor, break the tumor, and you will be able to remove this tumor in very quick time. If you take five hours to remove this tumor, then you don't know how to remove this tumor. You have to break into the tumor. There is no need to coagulate inside the confines of the tumor. These kind of nubbins are interdural, dura here, dura here, dura here. And this anatomy, as I have mentioned, very critical. Grade two is when the tumor encases the carotid artery, enters into the confines of the cavernous sinus. The lateral wall remains intact. The diaphragm remains intact. There is cavernous sinus, grade two. Why this medial wall is very critical. Why some tumors enter into cavernous sinus, why some do not enter is a very difficult subject to define. You see carotid artery encased within the cavernous sinus. This medial compartment of cavernous sinus, what is medial dural wall are controversial issues and a lot of things have been talked about it. Some tumors like this is cavernous, hemangioma of cavernous sinus, no matter how big it becomes, it does not affect the medial wall. It will not go into the pituitary gland. There is dura here always. This is cavernous hemangioma. Why some tumors go into cavernous sinus and why some tumors of cavernous sinus do not go into pituitary gland is a difficult thing to understand. So we have to understand the relationship of carotid artery and how it is displaced and how it is encased, which is very important for when we are going to operate on pituitary tumor. So this is grade two, diaphragm is elevated, cavernous sinus, lateral wall is not, is never transgressed by these tumors. You see both cavernous sinuses, diaphragm, lateral wall, it is completely interdural completely interdural location. It is not going out of the cellar dura. Even when it goes into the paranasal sinuses, these grade one tumors, 
have a well-defined dural cover and that is very important. So when it goes into the cavernous sinus, it is grade two. The lateral wall remains intact. The diaphragm remains intact. The, the lateral wall can be tightened. The diaphragm can be stretched, but not transgressed. Roof of cavernous sinus elevation was never described before in the literature. This is dural roof, diaphragm. So it is, it is a very common clinical entity, elevation of roof of cavernous sinus. This is elevation of diaphragm cell. Elevation of roof of cavernous sinus, elevation of diaphragm cell. You see very beautifully seen elevation of roof of cavernous sinus, elevation of diaphragm. Beautiful, you see elevation of roof of cavernous sinus, elevation of diaphragm. Elevation of roof of cavernous sinus, elevation of diaphragm. This is elevation of roof, elevation of diaphragm, elevation of roof. This is elevation of roof of cavernous sinus. This is, you see small little nub in here is roof of cavernous sinus. This is the diaphragm cell. This is elevation of roof, diaphragm cell. This is elevation of roof, elevation of diaphragm, elevation of roof. In this complex looking tumor, you see these are all dural nubbins. This is elevation of roof, elevation of diaphragm, elevation of roof. This looks very complex kind of situation, but this is elevation of roof of cavernous sinus. So these are intracranial, all right, but they are subdural or interdural. You see, it is going elevation of roof of cavernous sinus. So the vision is involved by this part and not by this part. You see here, there is some bleeding within the tumor. This is another tumor, beautiful elevation of roof of cavernous sinus. Grade four tumors are those where the artery of circular villus are encased by the tumors and artery of basilar arteries and case. So these are aggressive tumors. These are different tumors. So surgery is very, very important for this because we have to understand these tumors, make an anterior wall incision, break the tumor, break the tumor, and these tumors will ultimately fall. Sometimes you see extension into the paranasal sinuses can be there, but there is a method in this madness and we have to understand this method. So this is my long old slide where I had analyzed these cases. So now carefully see this slide. This is the fetus, the muscle of uterine muscle is the strongest muscle of the body. Can you believe it is stronger than bicep muscle? It has the power to push the baby down. Similarly, the diaphragm cell is a very powerful membrane. It has the power to push the tumor down. So you just break the anterior wall, break the tumor, break the tumor, and the whole diaphragm will come down. In 15 or 20 minutes or maximum half an hour, you should be able to remove this tumor. And the patient will instantly improve in the vision. You see, there are some cystic necrotic changes. You open the tumor, cyst and necrosis, learn to break the tumor, learn to demolish the tumor, and it will be very easily done. So this is another huge tumor and can be very beautifully done. There is a nub in here, but that does not mean it is intradural and this is post-operative scan. Even when it is a little bit curved and list like this, you can break and you can have a very beautiful resection. This kind of tumor, I will say one of the easier tumors to operate, very large belly, open the belly, break into the belly and then deliver the baby. And it is not, it is, every operation is not easy or not difficult. It is very important to philosophically understand. There is dura here, break into the tumor. There is softness. There is, these tumors can be broken and within half an hour or 20 minutes, you can have this kind of result and the patient will instantly improve in vision. So whether we want to use endoscope and whether we want to use microscope, that is a different issue. Philosophical understanding, this tumor I had removed in 1988, 1998, about 25 years ago. You can imagine at that time I had just removed anterior wall and removed this tumor. Then no need to even remove the tuberculum cellae and planar spinal. This tumor I had removed in the year 2000. Beautifully, as you can imagine, at that time, all these cases were done transcranial and it was not such an easy operation to be done at that point of time. You see here, this tumor just anterior wall, break the tumor and the tumor ultimately will come down and beautifully come down. You see this extension, learn how to bring the diaphragm down, learn how to break the tumor. 
and we can do many of these tumors in very beautiful fashion and some of these tumors I'm showing you, these have been removed and most important is if you do not know how to remove it, you can actually kill the person by removing partially. This tumor I removed 23 years ago and here I had left some tumor behind and at that time and after 2007, it recurred. So tumors which are more than six centimeters, I like to give radiation treatment even if I have removed the tumor completely. So this tumor I had removed completely in 2001. In 2008, he comes with a recurrence. So tumors more than six centimeters, I like to give radiation upfront even if I have removed the tumor completely. So these are dangerous tumors. These are difficult tumors. How to remove the part of cavernous sinus is another very big subject. But many of these tumors need not be removed. Many of the functional tumors have to be removed. How to remove the cavernous sinus portion, whether transcranial surgery is necessary or not. Very rarely transcranial surgery may be indicated for tumors involving the cavernous sinus. More important is, that in functioning tumors, we have to remove these tumors and we have to know how to remove this tumor. And understanding that elevation of roof of cavernous sinus is an important entity. So if you have left this tumor behind, I had a feeling that there is this recurrence in these tumors is very high rate. So you see here, I had left this tumor in the, in the year 2003, 20 years ago. And in 2009, there is a huge recurrence. So now I give radiation for such tumors where there is a residual tumor. This is another tumor involving both cavernous sinus and, you know, aggression is, of course, our very important thing. Roof of cavernous sinus has been removed and this patient is living without any tumor recurrence for several, several years. When the tumor elevates the roof and there is residue, I like to give radiation treatment. This patient is the only patient where the lateral wall is nubbed like this. And I had given radiation treatment for this patient. This patient, I had done transcranial surgery. I will say transcranial surgery is very rarely necessary in large pituitary tumors. So this is the tumor. I had removed the midline. I had left both these parts and this tumor was subjected for radiation treatment. Tumors which go beyond the dura of diaphragm. Those are like snakes and they are very dangerous and difficult and aggression, whether aggression should be done or whether conservative resection is a question mark even for me and with my whatever thing I have done, I think these have to be studied more. And more recently, I have realized that these tumors, which are grade four tumors, are hormonally sensitive and many of these are uh, treated by cabagulin and anti this uh, prolactinomas and can be treated by drugs. So this was treated by drugs and uh, many of these tumors which are haphazard in extension can be treated effectively by drugs even on occasion when the hormonal dysfunction cannot be measured you can treat them with drugs. So and we recently we studied the proteomics of these tumors and gradation so the danger issues in giant pituitary tumor is when it is very big tumor, when it is higher grade tumor. If the patient has come drowsy to you, it is very bad news. When this patient comes with altered behavior and consciousness, it is a very bad news. When this patient has come with hypothalamic dysfunction, it is very bad news. And you have to con consider conservative treatment option. Radiation is a controversial thing, but these are my indications. Grade four, I like to give radiation. Grade three, I like to do when there is residue. Grade one, size more than five centimeter and recurrent tumor. Recurrent, not residue. More recently, we studied proteomics of these tumors. So I know I'm overstepping my time. And thank you very much, uh, Sharon. I hope I've been able to give some, some beautiful lessons on these tumors, which are dangerous tumors, which neurosurgeons, all of us want to do pituitary tumors. All of us have experience in pituitary tumors. And I wish that all of us understand these tumors in a very beautiful fashion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Atul. Um, will you be around till the end of the session? I have. I'm, I will be there for some time, Sharon. But I have to leave because I came specially for this lecture. I am not in my town, yeah, but know. on your invitation, I came here. I will be here for some time. Thank sure. you, Sharon. 
maybe we can take uh, one or two questions. Uh, any questions for Prof. Atul before we proceed with our next speaker? Maybe Alexander? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Professor Professor Goals. Uh, really great as always, uh, your great experience. Uh, and uh, I also have some experience uh, with the giant pituitary and the invasive and so on. So really, uh, this, um, I want to uh, maybe uh, summarize a little bit this uh, this giant and this terrible MRI pituitary adenomas, uh, if, um, when they are, when they are um, managed in proper way, they do not cause a real threat for a patient's life. And the correct um, <clears throat> correct management, correct treatment of this treatment uh, is always aimed to <clears throat> improve the patient's quality of life and never is aimed at uh, radical uh, tumor excision. Uh, what do you think about it? Is, uh, is our goal to be maximally radical with this tumor or just we must think about the patient patient's quality of life and maybe for example in my in, in my experience i think that uh to tumor will grow go on growing it's benign tumor and i hesitate to send to radi to radiation or just wait and remove the tumor in eight ten years again once more Usually, I choose the second option. So, what do you think about it, Alexander? Uh, uh, thank you very much. You see, I a little bit differ with this opinion. You know, this is very good suggestion for meningiomas, for acoustic tumor, for instance, for glioma's maybe, but not for pituitary tumors. Pituitary tumor, you know what? If it becomes large and you do a small resection. 30% resection or 40% resection, the residual tumor can bleed and it can bleed to death. So in pituitary tumors, large tumors and giant tumors, we have to be always radical. And we have to, you know, when we are doing from the nose, the whole diaphragm should come into picture and radical surgery is possible because these tumors are not firm or not, you know, and because they are protected by the mother diaphragm, you can be very safe. It is not like uh, meningioma, which is encasing the internal carotid artery or perforator. So my feeling is, and I, Alexander, I completely believe in this, that giant pituitary tumors or at least large pituitary tumors should be removed radically. Conservative option is not available in, uh, in uh, giant pituitary tumors. The question comes about part which involves the cavernous signs. Yes. That part may not be removed. That yes. part in giant pituitary tumor should not be removed because, you know, you can unnecessarily affect the sixth cranial nerve function, which is not, uh, you know, which may not be a presenting feature. But many of these tumors are soft and you can actually follow this tumor in the cavernous sinus. So cavernous sinus portion may be left behind if you are not, you know, uh, really if the tumor is a little bit formidable. But the part under the diaphragm should always be radically removed. Alexander. Yes, I agree. I completely agree with you. I, I really do the same. I, I meant the, the part which invade to the cavernous uh, sinus and especially beyond the internal carotis. Uh, I meant this. So in my practice, I always uh, try to be radical with the super supracellular part. But and I'm not like, completely agree with you with, uh, with you that um, all the invasive nodes are covered with the uh, um, diaphragma. Unfortunately, it's sometimes in covered, uh, but some very, very, very s slim uh, so, uh, kind of pseudo capsule. But uh, fortunately, almost all the invasive nodes could be dissected from the brain. In majority of cases, uh, maybe with the exception of when they're Tightly, mm, uh, tightly adhere it with the perforators, perforating arteries. Maybe this is only the when I I, I prefer to, to leave this uh, border, this. But uh, when I understand that I cannot remove via transfernoidal, I 
always uh, considered uh, any kind of transcranial and, and even combined transcranial approach. So this is my option. I know about bleeding to the residual, of course I know, and I always prevent, prevent it in, in every case, and I never let it uh, be in my practice. So thank you very much. It's a really great lecture, and it was thank a very you. interesting discussion with you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you Alexander. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Alexander. I think we have one question from Hiba. Hiba, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Professor Gold, for this uh, presentation. I also have attended your uh, previous lecture about uh, glioma, and I admire your. Um, uh, I don't. I don't want to say invasive, but it's uh, maximum resection of them. So I have uh, two questions in in this case about going uh, transplanted for big meningiomas. Uh, sometimes they are. I think maybe they are attached to the arachnoids, uh, even to the hypothalamus. So. Uh, how do you manage uh, to dissect them uh, transphenoidal without uh, the risk of hypothalamic injury? Uh, also, if there is a bleeding that occurs, how do you think is the most possible way for controlling bleeding in, in a very limited scope? Uh, the second question is, uh, if you have experienced uh, some of those cases, I think they have uh, chiasmal um, compression from this large tumor. And after the decompression, the chiasm is more relaxed. Um, I don't know uh, the proper term for it, but it's, it's the, the the chiasm is more stretched out. So after the decompression, some people actually develop uh, even poor vision or worsening of the vision due to the decompression of the chiasm. Uh, I hope I'm delivering the question um, to you. Okay. So let me let me answer these questions. Question number one is: I'm telling you, Iba. Just yeah. listen to what I'm saying. You have your concepts clear. If you have your concept clear, you will be able to remove these tumors relatively easily. If you have your concept that there is a diaphragm which covers the tumor. If you do not have this concept and you think that these tumors are stuck to the subarachnoid arteries and nerves and all those things, you will not be able to remove majority of pituitary tumors easily. You will have tremendous problems. And, my, and I am very, very clear that if you do not have this understanding of diaphragm, you just cannot remove this tumor. Okay, this is my understanding. And if you have this understanding that there is a beautiful membrane which covers the diaphragm membrane, which covers the tumor, you remove the tumor, remove the tumor, remove the tumor, and ultimately the whole diaphragm comes in pumping into your picture. And that is the end of the story. You don't have to look for hypothalamus, you don't have to look for chiasma, you don't have to look for any artery supradiaphragmatic. You have this concept, you, you study this concept. I want you to go back and see the images. You will never find an art, never miss, those are grade four tumor inside the, inside the confines of the tumor. So you have this understanding. And when the whole tumor comes down, the diaphragm comes down, there is, don't have this concept that, Chiasma will herniate and all those things. Those are very difficult to, you know, here and there cases have been reported, but that is not the true thing. You have to remove the tumor and that is your job. You remove it beautifully, completely. I don't coagulate within the confines of the tumor ever. I have done more than 5,000 P2T tumors. I don't think ever coagulation has come into my picture. Break the tumor, break the tumor, break the tumor, and then the diaphragm comes, put gel form inside the area and if there is some csf that you are seeing then you have to put fat into that area and that is a beautiful clinical outcome if you leave 20 percent of oh this is stuck to the artery i don't want to remove oh this is stuck to the chiasma i don't want to remove oh this is stuck here then you have a very big disaster you can kill the person these patients can die after surgery so either you know when you go for evening round after doing the morning operation you will say, doctor, he will say, patient, oh, doctor, you are, I can see you better now. You are looking much better and handsome. On the other hand, when you go for evening round, your resident will say that patient is not here only, he's in the mortuary. So either patient sees you properly and beautifully, or you see the patient. These are, these are the two things in pituitary tumor, large tumor. So better have them see you rather than you not seeing him. You understand, Heba? Yeah, I do get it. You got my story right? I got, I got it. I got it. Thank you. <laughs> no, these are beautiful tumors, benign tumors. And these are not cancer. 
You learn this art, learn the art. And young, our young neurosurgeons have to learn this art of breaking the tumor. And we have to learn how to be philosophical. And we have to learn the power of mother, mother dura, dura matter, matter means mother. We have to understand the power of mother. Mothers, the tumor respect the mother. Even the tumors which do not respect mother and they go beyond, those are aggression. They, those children are not good who are not respecting their mother. So tumors respect their mother, benign tumors always respect their mother. You respect the mother when you are operating. You don't disrespect the mother. You don't transgress the power of the mother. You remember this, Hiba, okay? I do, I'll keep them. Thank you. I think, um, I think you didn't answer once, one, didn't answer Hiba's question about post-op sudden deterioration in the vision. If the patient, yeah. He I mentions think, a rare case, I think. I've seen, yeah, yeah exactly, know, but I've also seen that happen. Yeah. If another thing, you know what? Another question, let me answer this question, which is very important. Suppose you operate on a large pituitary tumor and post-operatively your patient is saying, the doctor, I cannot see it, see properly or I am blind or I cannot see at all. So what you will do at that time? You know, if you have done packing of the fat in the area, you must remember sometimes you can overpack it, immediately re-explore the patient and remove the pack. And if the patient has worsened post-operatively, don't say that uh, chiasma has gone down or this has gone, there may be some clot in that area. Immediate re-exploration. If the post-operative, you go and see the patient, the patient is not having good vision, re-explore the patient. Sometimes gel foam can bulge and all those things. If the patient has worsened, that is not a good thing. You cannot just give steroids and observe, okay, I will see tomorrow and I will wait and he will improve. No, that is not a good option. Particularly when you have done fat packing. Fat packing is, I have seen at least one or two patients where my fat, I remove the fat, operation following that, the patient recovers in the vision. Vision deterioration is a huge thing. We should not be, you know, we should have this idea. In them. Thank you. Thank you. Anything, any more? Anyone wants to add anything else? Prof. Alexandra, anything? Thank you very much. Uh, we could discuss for a long, long time about all of this, but I, I'd like, uh, I propose to finish uh, the discussion because we have uh, uh, many talks ahead. So, Professor Goel, Go, uh, thank you very much. My pleasure to have uh, some, to have this discuss discussion with you. It, I really always enjoy your lectures. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Sharon. And thank you, dear Yoko Kat. Thanks yeah. so much. It was a wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. Uh, it was a very fantastic uh, lecture. All right, so now moving on to our uh, second presenter. Uh, she will uh, present uh, Kami uh, Badejo from Africa. Kami Badejo is uh, a consultant a neurological surgeon to the U University College Hospital Ibadan and also a senior lecturer at the College of Medicine, University of Ibadan, Nigeria. She, alongside Dr. Emmanuel, is the second indigenously trained Nigerian female neurosurgeon. She's the coordinator of the postgraduate training at the Department of Neurological Surgery, UCH Ibadan, and an audio abstract contributor for Neurosurgery Speaks Congress of Neurological Surgeons. She currently serves as the co-chair of the neurovascular section of the Nigerian Association of Neurological Surgeons and the chair of the Women in Neurosurgery section of the Young Nigerian Neurosurgeon Forum. So here I present Kemi Badejo will speak on vascular brain lesions in a Nigerian neurosurgical facility, a post-computerized tomographic error profile. Kemi can take over. Uh, you're, you're muted, you're muted. We can't hear you. You can share your screen.
Can you unmute, Kimmy? We can't hear you. We can't hear you. I can't hear me. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, now we can hear you. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kemi Badejo, and I'll be presenting vascular brain lesions in the Nigerian Neurosurgical Facility, a post-computerized tomography error profile under the outline shown. By way of introduction, intracranial vascular lesions constitute a diverse group of central nervous system disorders arising from or related to the intracranial vessels. These lesions are mostly benign. Published data on these anomalies in Nigerian neurosurgical literature are limited. And although these lesions are curable, they carry high rates, high morbidity and mortality rate. It is therefore important for clinicians to be aware of this group of diseases. The next slide shows some of the intracranial vascular lesions with intracranial aneurysms, arteriovenous malformations, and cavernous malformations being the ones uh, most commonly seen in our subregion, and I will talk a little on this. Intracranial aneurysms are they're abnormal focal outpouchings of the intracranial vessels, intracranial arteries that are prone to rupture. But then we should note that some aneurysms are prone to ischemic events. Whereas the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is trauma, the most common cause of spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage is ruptured barrier aneurysm. The true incidence of intracranial aneurysms is unknown and varies um, based on the study, whether post-mortem or radiological, but currently about 6% of the world's population is third to arbo and intracranial aneurysm with high rates in Asian and Finnish populations as high as 9%. Incidence of these lesions increases with advancing age. And um, while the most prevalent risk factors for intracranial aneurysms are modifiable, the strongest risk factors are those with genetic and familial basis. The pathogenesis of this lesion is due to a complex interplay of multiple factors, some of which are congenital and others acquired, and this include hemodynamic stress, vascular wall architecture, genetic predisposition, external modifiable factors, and other systemic factors as shown on the screen. And this slide shows some of the non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors for developing intracranial aneurysms. Those lesions can be classified based on size, based on shape, based on etiology, and based on the vessel of origin. They may be multiple sometimes, and um, this situation occurs more commonly in females than in males. The clinical features, intracranial aneurysms may be symptomatic and could be incidental findings while, while um, found when the patient has been evaluated for unrelated causes. But by and large, the most dramatic clinical presentation is a frank rupture, in which case um, patients present with um, features of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Some patients could present with um, features relating to compression, from the aneurysm sac, an example of that, that would be a third nerve palsy from a posterior communicating aneurysm. Like I said before, a ruptured aneurysm would present with subarachnoid arachnoid hemorrhage, and uh, we're all familiar with the features and um, some of them as those shown on the slide. It, it's important um, to, reiterate that 
32 to 50% of patients with a ruptured aneurysm will die before getting to the hospital. And this slide shows a postmortem brain specimen showing spillage of blood into the subarachnoid space from a rupture left IC aneurysm. The image to the right shows a ruptured um, basilar tip aneurysm. The size and location of aneurysms are the two most important factors that influence rupture of aneurysms. Indeed, postural circulation aneurysms are eight to 14 times more likely to rupture than their anterior circulation counterparts. And um, this, this um, slide also shows um, the relationship between the size and site of aneurysm and the five-year cumulative risk of rupture. We could see that the bigger the size, the higher the risk of rupture. And when compared size for size, posterior circulation aneurysms are more likely than the anterior counterparts to bleed. So this slide shows one of the patients managed in our center who uh, presented the features of the fissure, grade four, subarachnoid hemorrhage. No, the, the sulcal subarachnoid hemorrhage, the intracerebral hematoma compressing the body of the corpus callosum, the intraventricular extension of those bleed. The coronal cuts, there's a non-contrast um, Cranial computerized tomography scan shows the clots, the, the subarachnoid um, bleed um, to be thicker on the right side compared to the left. It's a um, para, paramedian location. And on further investigation of this patient with the cranial computerized tomography scan, a small right pericalosal artery aneurysm was revealed. Pericalosal artery aneurysms are usually small, but they are notorious for their high tendency to bleed. This patient went on to have craniotomy and successful clipping of the aneurysm and was discharged from clinic five years after five years of follow-up. The next slide shows the brain magnetic resonance and geography of a patient of ours who presented with a right MCA bifurcation aneurysm. And um, this slide shows the intraoperative um, pictures um, image of the aneurysm, which was successfully clipped. The patient um, is two years post-op now and she's doing well. Um, the, this is a post-op post neuroimaging showing um, successful um, um, well, obliteration of the aneurysm sac. Now on to the arteriovenous malformations. These are dynamic, high pressure, high through dysplastic vascular lesions characterized by abnormal connections between arteries and veins without inter an intervening capillary bed. There are common causes of neurological morbidity and mortality and can occur in any part of the brain. They can occur in isolation or in concurrence with other types of vascular brain lesions. They have a lifelong risk of bleeding of two to 4% per year. And the goal of definitive treatment is complete excision of this, um, of this lesions. They like Intracranial aneurysms, true incidence is unknown, or FAVMs is unknown, varies um, between the types, different types of study. It should is important to note that it accounts for about 2% of all strokes and 35% of all intracerebral hematoma in patients between 15 and 45 years. Indeed, is an important cause of stroke in the young. Some studies report a slight male preponderance, and these lesions are usually supratentorial and superficial. They could, they, they mostly occur singly, but could be multiple. And when multiple, they, they're often syndromic. Now, um, onto the 
and geographical architecture of AVMs, um, of which you're all aware. Um, just a reminder, we have the arterial feeders, we have the NIDAs, we have the draining veins, and uh, some of these um, arterial feeders are the, the terminal feeders, the, the, the supply feeders to the NIDAs of the AVMs. Some of the vessels around um, the AVM are transit vessels. They just pass through to supply normal brain structures without contributing to the NIDAs. And we have some indirect feeders supplying normal brain structures We're sending feeders to the NIDAs. And in the process of um, excision of the AVM, the parent vessel needs to be preserved to prevent on, uh, to prevent patient, um, new onset neurologic deficits in the patients. We have different classification systems with important bearing on the operability of the tumor. Important point is um, the higher the score, the higher the, the associated, the risk associated with surgical intervention. Some AVMs are associated with aneurysms, some with varix formation. The parenchymal elements tend to be gliotic, hemosiderine stain, and non functional. And um, the, they could be associated with um, interstitial calcifications, as would be shown in one of the slides um, later. Now, Bleeding would occur when there's a mismatch between vessel wall, vessel wall integrity and vessel wall stress. AVMs offer, offer a low resistant vascular shunt and pre preferably, preferably diverts blood from the, the surrounding normal brain tissue, the so-called vascular steel phenomenon. The adjacent brain adapts to low perfusion pressures and the uh, autoregulatory ability fails at normal perfusion pressure. The excision of an AVM with restoration of normal physiologic pressure could cause breakthrough hemorrhages called the normal, um, normal perfusion pressure breakthrough hemorrhages. Clinical presentations as shown from asymptomatic to bleeding into the different spaces as shown on the slide. The next slide is that of a patient of the unit who uh, initially presented in infancy with previous, uh, with um, spontaneous intraventricular hemorrhage. This patient was lost to follow up and in adulthood presented back to the neurologist with seizures. Further investigation revealed the left hemispheric arteriovenous malformation, which was deemed to be inoperable at the time. This next series of um, images are those um, of a patient with the left frontal arteriovenous malformation. The first slide shows uh, intralesional calcifications and the angiography defined, um, as we can see, defined uh, the angioarchitecture of the AVM better. The next slide um, is um, brain MRI and um, MRA of magnetic resonance imaging and magnetic resonance and geography of the patient with a right temporal arteriovenous malformation. Um, there's a role for medical management um, in, the, in this, but this is mainly um, limited to the, to the control of seizures, um, plus or minus um, headaches, and the indications are shown in operability, for um, for for um, surgical candidate to patient's choice, other um, treatment modalities include um, embolization, serotaxel, radio surgery, not available in um, our sub region, and um, the the 
treatment option available to our patients is um, surgical excision. And um, as we all know, the principle of surgical excision includes um, good exposure, careful subarachnoid dissection. It's important to take the feeder vessels arteries before clipping off the draining vein to avoid the rise in the intranidal pressure and, um, and as such prevent untable rupture of the arteriovenous malformation. Next slide um, is that of the patient of the unit, initially managed by the neurology team for a right hemispheric ischemic stroke. Three years later, he developed seizure disorder during the evaluation of which was discovered to have a right parietal arteriovenous malformation. The, that's the MR angiography of uh, defining the lesion better. He went on to have um, craniotomy and excision of the, of the lesion. Um, that's a post-op imaging of the patient confirming complete um, excision. He was thereafter successfully weaned off his anti-seizure medications and has remained well four years after follow-up. Now on to cavernous malformations. These are also known as cavernomas, the vascular lesions consisting of compact bundles of dilated capillaries like channels lacking intervening neural parenchyma. They can be either familial or sporadic. And um, these are angiographically occult lesions that are best detected on magnetic resonance imaging. Like AVMs, they can present with seizures, hemorrhage, progressive neurological deficit, and um, medical management mainly for treatment of headache and seizure, but surgery is a mainstay of therapy and the role of tactic radiosurgery remains controversial in the management of the solutions remain controversial. The next um, slide is of one of the patients um, of the unit who presented with recurrent um, stroke. And um, she was found to have a pontine cavernoma, but also had um, a pituitary incidentaloma um, for which she was um, completely asymptomatic. The next slide shows a patient with a left um, cerebellar lesion, which was confirmed histologically as a cerebellar hemangioblastoma. Um, the next slide um, is that of a patient with repeated episodes of hemorrhagic um, stroke. And um, she was evaluated with cranial CT and geography, which showed an anomalous vessel arising from the left internal carotid artery. Um, this um, vessel had a fusiform aneurysm proximally and distally um, some um, circular aneurysms. The image to the right is a closer look at the main trunk of the vessel, still showing the proximal fusiform aneurysm with an angiographic dimple, a bleb. The, this trunk had um, an arterial fenestration. You can see where the vessel divided and then reunited. And then um, distally, the white arrow shows um, a distal circular aneurysm. This um, patient um, died from a poor grade, a poor grade uh, subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage. The next um, is of a young man who had um, features of meningeal irritation repeatedly in the past. And um, he was managed at different hospitals, treated at different times for bacterial and even TB meningitis he was on a full course of um, an anticox therapy. However, um, when he came to us, um, he presented with um, with a WFNS grade one, features of a WFNS grade one subarachnoid hemorrhage, and further evaluation of this patient showed that he had a cervical medullary junction at a venous malformation. Next slide um, shows the lesion better, that's CT and geography, and then we can see that it's also associated uh, with an aneurysm. 
um, sometimes we have patients with venous gallon malformation. Um, there is no facility for endovascular um, therapy in our country. And mostly when this patient comes, if they have um, hydrocephalus, they only get treated for that and referred for further therapy. But most of them can afford to seek the appropriate treatment outside um, of the country. Next slide um, shows an infant who presented with the mid occipital scalp swelling, which is um, excised found to be capillary hemangioma. The next slide is that of um, a middle aged woman with a right channel IC aneurysm. She also presented with the um, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, she, WFNS grade three, she later developed a deep venous thrombosis for which she had an inferior vena cava filter and later on had a clipping of the aneurysm. Was also treated um, for progressive hydrocephalus um, with a ventricular peritoneal shunt. Sometimes we could have uh, multiple aneurysms um, like we have in this patient with a bilateral terminal IC aneurysm and the right MC bifurcation aneurysm, which appear to have been the culprit in this um, in the index of arachnoid hemorrhage because we can see um, a large clot in the right sylvian fissure. Same day of presentation, the patient deteriorated and um, a repeat scan showed evidence of um, ischemic, um, well, ischemia in the region of distribution of the right MCA. This is likely due to um, vessel spasm that's delayed, um, delayed ischemic neurologic deficits, a well-known complication of ruptured aneurysms. Next slide um, shows um, the neuroimaging of a patient with hemoglobinopathy who presented um, with, um, she presented with a right um, M hemispheric um, cerebrovascular accident. The, during the course of um, evaluation and the source of referral, she was found to have a right MC bifurcation aneurysm for which she was referred to as repeat neuroimaging showed a spontaneous um, resolution of this um, aneurysm. She also had um, features of um, ischemia, um, features of uh, ischemic changes in the brain, likely from a vasospasm. This um, image shows um, scalp cessoid aneurysms in a 40-year-old man. We have the clinical image and the neuroimaging, um, cranial, CT, and geography. So now on to our local experience at the University College Hospital, the battle over a 10-year period between 2011 and 2021, we've seen a total of 101 cases of spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage with a male-female distribution of about um, ratio of about three to one. The age ranges from the neonatal period to up to 76 years. This slide shows that more than half of these patients were over 40 years old, with most of them fall, falling between the 61 to 78 bracket. Most of these aneurysms were anterior circulation aneurysms with the terminal ICA accounting um, for most of this lesion. Lesions followed closely by posture communicating artery aneurysms. 44 of these patients had surgical intervention and they were followed up um, for a period of between two months and six years. The, most of them had clipping and um, for some with a non-clippable aneurysm, some of them had wrapping. For some patients, some patients presenting with poor grade subarachnoid um, hemorrhage with intraventricular extension and hydrocephalus. Um, some of them had um, the um, external ventricular drain insertion. So this chart um, just shows the distribution 
of the intervention which this patient had. Of the 44 patients who had surgery, 90% of them had a good outcome and none of them had a rebleed afterwards during the period of the follow-up. Next slide shows um, the profile of surgically treated intracranial vascular lesions in Ipadon. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we see um, the lesions we see most commonly are intracranial and neurosemes, atorbinous malformations and carbonomas. Um, this slide shows the trend of vascular surgery in a facility over the study period. The next one shows um, distribution of um, atorvenous malformations in terms of location and also their gender distribution. Now on to some publications from Nigeria between um, 1967 in 2021, we have um, 15 publications on intracranial vascular lesion, lesions, and I would um, talk about a few of them. The pioneer neurosurgeon in our country, Professor Deku, um, in 1968, published um, the um, profile of um, intracranial vascular anomalies in Nigeria. That was a pre ct era, and diagnosis was mainly done by cerebral angiograms. Out of a total of um, 19 cases, um, most of them, 63% with barrier neurosims, followed by atelvenous malformations. They find a male preponderance in the series. Professor Ade Loye et al. 1960 looked at um, sub spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage in Nigerians and found a total of 12 intracranial vascular lesions following evaluation of 60 patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Nine of them had intracranial aneurysms and um, three had um, atelvenous malformations. Professor Uwebulam also, well, he considered the possibility of racial bias, um, intracranial art arterial aneurysms, wondering if indeed um, these lesions are rare in, in Black Africans. And um, in this, he reported five diagnosed and two suspected cases over a two year period and concluded that these lesions are rare in our sub-region. The study by Du et al. was the pioneering autopsy study. They evaluated 100 middle cerebral arteries in 15 individuals and found no aneurysm. Obole et al. Uh, made the first, um, well, had looked at the first series in the um, CT era. So they did a CT, and geography-based study looking at 62 patients over a two-year period, um, looking at patients who had um, computer, who had CTA um, over a two-year period. Um, there was a 42% yield for intracranial vascular lesions. Interestingly, they found more um, AVMs than intracranial aneurysms. There, were, there have been some um, case reports on some rare vascular brain lesions um, from venogalin and use malformation to uh, congenital cystoid and neurosine. But the largest series in both the pre and post CT era was that of Adekomi et al. They looked at 121 cranial computerized tomography and job graphies in patients with suspected vascular brain lesions. They had a 48% yield for vascular brain lesions, most of which were intracranial aneurysms. And they found most of these to involve the anterior circulation and the female preponderance in the study. The most recent series is um, that of Adele et al. But this looked at um, intracranial aneurysms between um, January um, 1988 and December 1999. They um, had um, 17 patients, eight antemortem and nine postmortem cases. Most of the aneurysms were ruptured. PECOM aneurysms predominated the antemortem series, whilst MC aneurysms 
predominated the post-mortem cases. Now, what are the gaps that we have in our literature um, and expertise? Um, there's no data out there on magnetic resonance and geographic profile of intracranial aneurysms in Nigeria. We need larger autopsy-based studies. There's yet um, no endovascular therapy for vascular brain lesions, including acute management of ischemic stroke. Yes, um, we know a few private facilities um, have managed um, a few cases, but these are not available on demand and are being provided by um, Nigerian um, interventional neurologists in diaspora. Um, there's a need for multi-center studies on cerebrovascular pathologies in Nigeria. It's important for us um, to develop um, endovascular um, and the vascular neurosurgery in our facility, as this will go a long way to help our patients. In conclusion, intracranial vascular anomalies may not be as rare in African Nigerians as previously thought. This incidence is expected to keep rising with increasing availability of advanced neurodiagnostic modalities. Clinicians, therefore, need be aware of this potentially lethal yet treatable brain anomalies and neuroimaging of all patients with suspected stroke may likely yield more patients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kemi. Um, uh, Prof. Kato, you want to uh, make any comments? Uh, you can start. The screen, Kemi. Oh, th thank you very much, uh, Kemi. Uh, it was excellent talk. Thank you so much. Thank so, you. Uh, yeah, so right now, how many neurosurgeons in Nigeria now? Altogether? 132 neurosurgeons. 132, okay. Yes, please. So, mm, okay, so. That's uh, a population about, of about 200 million. I see. So I think maybe in the future we can collaborate with such kind of the hands-on or okay. uh, maybe a life surgery course uh, in your country. So with uh, Sharon and some other uh, board member uh, can make some plan for your country. Thank you very much. Maybe uh, Abida Shah is the expert of the fiber dissection. Mm. So maybe she can demonstrate of the fiber dissection at your country, uh, Sharon. And uh, sorry, Davida, can you tell us? Professor Kato, we can we can definitely organize maybe some live workshop also, live surgery workshop for some tumors. Oh, okay. Can, can we like to like that Yes. Can we just a question? Do you think the uh, number of aneurysms and vascular lesions? In your country is diagnosed is low is it because of the is it underdiagnosed and also maybe um, the lack of facilities so the numbers might not be true numbers yeah i think they are underdiagnosed um right now yes the the figures are still low but still um more than we used to get the figures are still low but more than we used to get. And this is because um, angiographic facilities are now readily available and affordable. And the, the, our neurology colleagues too, they have a lower threshold for neuroimaging patients um, with stroke. So we get more cases than we used to get in the past. That's good. Prof. Alexander, would you like to comment? Thank you. Thank you very much. What uh, my comment? I, I can only uh, wish you to have more uh, angiographic facilities in your country, and also to develop your collaboration with neurologists to inform. Just teach them. Teach them because no, I know. I know this. Is, I know we passed this way maybe thirty years ago in my country. Also, when we started in angiography, only CT, CT, angio. Uh, now it works, uh, and we still also we still also have problems with neurologists. So it's very, very important to have them as a partners. Partners are just not the guys uh, who work uh, separately, not in uh, one team with you. 
So this is my this is so my uh, my advice to you. For thank you very much. And thank and thank you for very good uh, presentation, very good analysis of literature and analysis of your own material. So thank you, Professor. Your talk is has a very good uh, scientific value. So congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you very much, Kemi. I think we're a bit short of time, so uh, we'll go on to our next uh, presenter. So our next presenter is uh, Dr. Landry Conan. He's an anatomist, neurosurgeon, and neuroscientist trained in Abidjan. He's got two master's degree in anatomy from Abidjan and University of Missouri, Columbia, and he's now doing a PhD in neurobiology at the University of Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, he has a joint appointment at the University of Felix, a uh, Hofni Boyne Ab Abidjan Ivory Coast as an anatomy lecturer and consultant neurosurgeon. He's also interested in neuroanatomy and his practice consists mainly of skull-based and cerebral vascular surgeries. He's the co-founder of the Neurosurgical Skill Lab in Abidjan and regularly receives and trains fellows in skull base and approaches endoscopic transphenoidal surgeries. Also is a Fulbright alumnus and a previous member of Young Ken's uh, education committee. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to uh, present uh, Dr. Landry Conan presenting Neurosurgery in Africa, Opportunities for Collaboration. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> I'll now share my screen. Well, thank you for the women in neurosurgery for inviting me today to present about um, Africa. And I will be presenting about <clears throat> opportunity um, for collaboration. So when we think about Africa, uh, we, we think about a big continent because Africa is big. As you can see here in the map, um, China, um, the United States and uh, India can fit, and some countries in, in Europe can fit in, in Africa. And <clears throat> I want to present it because Africa is also considered as a, okay, as a young continent, and, and we have 50, 54 countries in, in Africa, and, and according to the United Nations data from 2021, we are almost 137 billion people. And the majority of these are young people below the age of 25. So this um, continent has a lot of potential for future. Um, to talk about opportunity about neurosurgery in Africa, we need to understand how Africa is because Africa is diverse. Africa, Africa has uh, several sub-regions, Eastern, Central, Northern, and Southern Africa. And uh, one of the majority of Sub-Saharan Africa um, patients and even surgeons don't have uh, this opportunity to interact um, from one region to another. What I mean is you'll see that a lot of, a lot of people in West Africa that will communicate upon themselves um, people in Central Africa will communicate among themselves, but it's, it's, it's not common to see uh, collaboration between um, West African, for example, and South, South Africans, and uh, vice versa, and Eastern Africans. And this, uh, I think, is something that we as young neurosurgeons now will try to remediate and make it better. So I was talking about communication. So as you see here in this map, um, you have Northern African, we speak uh, a lot of Arabic. This is the indigenous languages predominate in this area. So there are several, um, these 137 billion people speak several languages. This is the big group. And when we look um, a little bit um, deeper there, we see that uh, we have a colonial past. And this is well known everywhere. And uh, a lot of countries, uh, what I see, I show here is um, a lot of countries speak French. And a lot of other countries speak also English. So there is this barrier language that make it easier for French speaking countries to communicate among themselves 
and English speaking countries also to communicate with, among themselves. But we need to make this bridge so that uh, we all have to, to, uh, to make a block and, and improve all together. So here is uh, on the right, the map of, of um, the language spoken. You see uh, green is Arabic and, and as I mentioned, French and in red, English. And a little bit of Spanish and Portuguese. And uh, of course, Ethiopian, they speak their own languages. So to talk about neurosurgery in Africa, where to, to, to give you the <clears throat> a global overview. So this paper, I found it in the literature from 1982 from um, a Nigerian neurosurgeon who depict the, the state of, of early state of neurosurgery in Africa. And as you see here, the main country that has neurosurgeon by the year 1982 was Egypt and South Africa. And um, we, in, in this paper, what we found was that um, neurosurgery established in Africa around the 1960s to 1970s. And by that, but 1982, what you can see here in yellow or orange here are countries with only one neurosurgeon. So I recall Sierra Leone, uh, Angola, so only one neurosurgeon by the time. And at that time, also the training center in countries were only limited to seven countries. They were training in, in North Africa, in South Africa, in uh, a little bit a part of South Africa, like in Zambia, Zimbabwe. But when we look 40 years later, 40 years later, we move from 126 to 1,156 African neurosurgeons. So it's it's a lot. So 40 years, thousand more neurosurgeon. This is a big improve. And uh, I'm kind of optimistic guy looking at, at the good side of Africa. So we're improving on the number of neurosurgeons. So it can be translated as uh, an increased awareness on uh, neurosurgical conditions. So as you can see, this effort to increase the number of neurosurgeons here came mainly from two initiatives. First was a um, neurosurgeon who was trained in Europe or in, in North America and came back to, to support neurosurgery in, in, in their own country. But the countries themselves start developing and implementing um, training centers. So in Africa, we have seven more countries like Africa, Benin, uh, Africa, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger. So seven more countries uh, open their neurosurgical training. In Central Africa, is, uh, it's only Cameroon that started a, a training program. And when uh, we look at Eastern Africa, we have five more countries that has established a training program in, the, in their own uh, environment. So here is again to see the improvement from 1982 to 2023. So over 41 years, we have this uh, increased and what we also have to understand is 40 years, that means it's mainly young neurosurgeon in Africa right now. And the majority of uh, those uh, neurosurgeons are below 40 years old. So we have uh, you know, your youth, the strength, and the willing to improve uh, our specialty in the continent. But um, another strong area is, um, as uh, Professor Yoko Kato mentioned, earlier, we have cadaveric lab and I really insist in cadaveric lab because I feel that this is um, a hub where we can reduce the learning curve. Um, so we have in, in Morocco, in Egypt, in South Africa, in Arikos, where um, I'm heavily involved in, in workshops and uh, cadaveric courses. As you can see here is a, a one of our trainee, a, a woman, she was performing medical school on the cadavers. So in, in, in Rwanda right now, uh, they are building ACAD Africa. This is, this is gonna be huge with over seven, 60 or 70 uh, um, people who can get there and get trained real time on cadavers. And I think this is gonna improve the level of skills among the Africans. So um, I also want to contrast about um, 
North Africa and Southern, Sub-Saharan Africa, because um, Northern Africa are more developed compared to, in, in terms of neurosurgical care, compared to Sub-Saharan Africa. They have more training program, as you can see. The, the, we have five countries in North Africa with 36 training program. When we contrast with the 48 over countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, as 40 training centers. And also when you look at the numbers of, of neurosurgeons, so this is the data from 2020, and I'm pretty sure that the, the number increased, but at that time in 2020, uh, we have five, uh, we have uh, 775 neurosurgeons in only North Africa, when in Sub-Saharan Africa, it was, the number was up to 390. And when we look in details in Egypt, by that time in 2020, Egypt had only at, at 400 neurosurgeons. So the number of neurosurgeons in Egypt was even more than the number of neurosurgeons in all Sub-Saharan Africa. So we have to contrast. They are uh, more um, advanced in terms of technologies too. So uh, now I would like to talk about partnership. So this is a, a study that um, come from um, Olivieri. It was made in 2021. So as you can see in the map of the globe, you have interaction with high income countries and low income countries. And when you see here, you see that the main collaboration uh, are between North Africa, Europe and Africa. And, uh, and we don't see a, a single collaboration with Africa, between Africa and Asia. And I think this, um, this webinar is one of the, the reason and one of the platform where we can start uh, exchanging idea to make it happen. So on the right side, um, I listed a number of international organizations that make partnership with Africa uh, in terms of increasing the access of, of neurosurgical care to patients. So we have Cure um, based in Uganda that have a, a strong program for uh, hydrocephalus treatment in children. They have um, uh, good people there who train in endoscopic third ventriculostomy. We have the Foundation for International Education in Neurological Surgeries and rubber training centers that have provided uh, over 50 uh, trainees uh, for sub saharan Africa. So in West Africa, for example, uh, a lot of our countries speak French. So we have collaboration with uh, many hospitals in France and in Belgium where uh, we send our trainings for one or two years fellowship. Uh, so this is also happening. And well Cornell in New York has a well-established training program with uh, people in Tanzania. Also Duke Africa as um, Duke in, uh, in US had a training uh, program and a partnership with East Africa and Kenya, I think. The Swedish um, association with no we African neurosurgeon, they um, have a partnership with people in Ghana and Nigeria. We have NeuroKid, we are also recently up surgeon that started uh, making uh, many collaboration with African countries. So these countries um, are doing collaboration and mainly collaboration based on the language. So in, in, as you see here, United States have a lot of collaboration with Eastern African uh, because of the language. And, and West African collaborate a lot with uh, Euro, France, Belgium because of the language. So we, we also need to, to make a platform where English speaking African and French speaking African will collaborate and make more um, uh, partnership with it. And again, Africa and Asia, we need to collaborate. And, and in my next slide, I will talk about why we need to collaborate. So we have uh, also uh, international, besides international partnership, Africa now, uh, as I mentioned, we're young, young, young um, neurosurgeons. So we are collaborating now and we have this uh, platform of the Continental Association of African Neurosurgical Society. And then right now I want to refloat uh, our colleague, Dr. Ignatius Eseni which is actually uh, the general secretary for this uh, association. Uh, he's doing a lot.
to promote African collaboration um, to improve uh, neurosurgical care in Africa. And we have the Mediterranean Association for Neurosurgical Surgeon. We have the COSEXA that is organizing collaboration in Eastern, Central, and Southern Africa. We have in West Africa, the West African um, College of Neurosurgeon, and we have a young uh, society called uh, the Society for Neuro-Oncology in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we have a lot of ongoing projects to increase um, the level of neurosurgery in, in Africa. So my point today about uh, why we can collaborate between African and Asians. So we have a lot of things in common. I have the privilege, I had the privilege to travel in China and some of my colleagues travel in India too. And they, they reported that we, we have this colonial past. We share a lot of culture, a lot of similar food and uh, a lot of socioeconomic background. What I mean by this is um, the level of, I'll say unemployment um, or low paid jobs is, is really prevalent in both continents. And beside that, as Dr. Atul Gold mentioned, patients when they come in, in uh, they come in Africa or in, in this country with no surgical condition, usually it's big tumors, big tumors, a big case because of late presentation based on the socioeconomic background. Most of the time, they don't have the, the financial mean to have an early diagnosis. And, and this is something that we share. We also have tuberculosis in the spinal, in the spine, and um, we have infectious disease. We have high level of, of um, neurotube defect that is some neurosurgical condition that we share with Asians too. And most importantly, low cost neurosurgery. By low cost neurosurgery, uh, um, I that, had that privilege to collaborate with some, some uh, medical companies in Asia that uh, can provide supplies with low cost. As, as you all know, um, neurosurgery depends a lot of consumable and um, treating, dealing with uh, people in Asia uh, have been a way for us to afford a neurosurgical instrument. So opportunities for collaboration. So. I was brainstorming with a lot of colleagues, um, African neurosurgeons, and we came up with this um, area of collaboration. As earlier, we mentioned about training centers and lab laboratory, we can organize dissection uh, there to, to uh, reduce the learning curve. We, we need uh, uh, to develop a neurosurgical pole of excellence in each region. Because we had a lot of uh, studies from the World um, Health Organization that shows that Africans are spending a lot of money to send the patient outside the continent for treatment. And in the term of neurosurgery, we need expertise in endovascular, skull-based, functional neuroanesthesiology, neurooncology. And I think in each region, we need to establish this pole of excellence so that it will be easier, reduce the cost of the travel, reduce um, the burden, the financial burden of treatment in, in, in these patients. And also we can organize student faculty exchange programs where a visiting lecturer can, can come or uh, we can exchange our student. And, and this is um, some of the point I want to elaborate a little bit here. So um, in June 30th, we have the World Federation uh, uh, WFNS Spine Committees. Uh, they organize um, in Kinshasa uh, live courses, discussion, and surgeries. And this is an example of this collaboration that we want to establish uh, among uh, Africans and Asian neurosurgeons. On the right here, these are some pictures of the neurosurgical skill lab that um, in which I'm involved, training um, and organizing workshop in skull base and in spine, and pituitary transferendal approach and so on. So we can use the five um, area that I spot earlier to organize these training and workshops. 
So again, I was I already talked about um, this pool of expertise in each region. So we're going, I will just move forward. So about student and faculty exchange program, this is something that we have been uh, we we did uh, in West Africa with a lot of uh, hospital in France. So there are agreement where um, our fellow when they finish the training or they are in the last year of the training they can go in France and really start uh, practicing there uh, and, and learn more and have a lot of exposure that they can learn and get expertise and come back in the country to improve uh, the level of care. So we can organize it in time of fellowship, visiting lecturer and professor. Uh, also with now um, Zoom, we can organize virtual grand ground between hospitals um, in Asia and Africa. So a lot of a lot of times we talk about you know training neurosurgeon training, um, but we need to train our fellow anesthesiologists and nurses because this is a team. This is a team. There is, it is for me pointless that we have highly skilled neurosurgeon who cannot perform because they lack neuroanesthesiologists and nurses. Well, we need to think about and find a way where we can send our nurses, our anesthesiologists to learn the, uh, the, the particularity of neuroanesthesia, neurocritical care, and this will guarantee that um, the outcome of our patient will be better. So also when I was talking about low cost uh, neurosurgery, we in Africa, um, unfortunately, we don't manufacture no surgical equipment at all. Maybe, maybe in, in Tunisia, I think they, they do medical school there, but the vast majority of Sub-Saharan Africa, we import. And importing um, consumable is really uh, bothersome. And um, what we used to do uh, was importing from Europe, but it's really expensive. And because now we see that in Pakistan, in India, in China, uh, we have companies there uh, that can um, make good quality instrument with affordable price. So right now, a lot of our attention now is divert to Asia where we can get those consumable. By consumable, for example, hemostatic agent, fibrin glues, um, aneurysm clip, uh, pedicle screw, Shabra, uh, for example, is a company where uh, we use a lot of the VP shunt, for example. So this is a collaboration that um, are done individually, but we need to, to make it uh, at a bigger scale to improve the, the, the quality and also affordable equipment for African neurosurgeons. So I would like to conclude now by saying that there is a strong desire for young African neurosurgeons to go extra miles. We, Nowadays, we can say that in Africa, at least in every country, there is at least one neurosurgeon in every country. This is a good point to, to mention. This one of, this was not the case in, in 1982. Right now we have this awareness growing about neurosurgical condition. And this um, partnership can be in the area of education. And I want to mention ICU nurses, anesthesiologists, need to be included in this partnership. And uh, together, I think uh, we can make it happen in Africa, decolonizing uh, the neurosurgical care in Africa. And, and I will finish by this um, sentence. Together, as a team, we can achieve more. Thank you. Thank you, Landry. Um, I think it was a very great eye-opener and I think a great introduction to um, this, the current situation in Africa and um, your current needs. Thank you very much. Uh, Prof Kato, would you like to say anything? Thank you very much, uh, the, uh, Landry. Uh, it is excellent talk, I think. Uh, our department, we will take uh, one nurse, neuro nurse, and also the one uh, neurosurgeon from Congo uh, from next month. And also now uh, we have a Heber from, uh, from Cairo. So and, uh, I, I think uh, 
not systematically uh, immediately, but I think the step by step. So we can accept if you can uh, uh, ask us. Eva, uh, can you say something? Uh, yes. Um... Uh, first of all, it's a great presentation about the current status in Africa and uh, in the Young uh, African uh, Congress, we have been meeting together uh, to discuss maybe the next step in the education process. So uh, I'm now in the fellowship program with Professor Katu and uh, she's a great mentor for all the young uh, neurosurgeon. Uh, and I think this could be a great opportunity for a collaboration between the two continents, Africa and uh, Asia. Uh, and on the other hand, maybe also we can still discuss a lot of educational webinars uh, that could be very constructive. So maybe we can just point out uh, the most important topics that you would want to address in educating the young neurosurgeon, whether it's an anatomy basis, surgical approaches, something like that uh, for the current being. Uh, maybe this could be uh, very applicable on a very short notice. I hope I'm, I'm yeah, helping. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. So maybe we can have some small the webinar uh, among the, uh, the such kind of the, the laundry or some uh, the young doctor from Africa. Yes, yes, we can definitely. In the future, just we can focus on about education, about uh, fellowship or whatever hands on, or maybe we can have some discussion among us. Sure, sure, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Okay, how do you think? Yes, it's a good idea, bro. I think we should do that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll continue on to, the, to our last speaker. So our last speaker is um, Dr. Oluva Mayowa Opara. I call her May. She's the one who helped me to organize this uh, collaboration in Africa. She's a consultant neurosurgeon, uh, Imo State Specialist Hospital, Ovary Imo State and Federal Medical Center, Umahe Abia State, Nigeria. She's the head of training and research of Imo State Specialist Hospital, secretary of the Young African Neurosurgeons Forum, co-chair of the Young Nigerian Neurosurgeons Forum, member of Neurotrauma Committee, Nigerian Academy of Neurological Surgeons, and she's a member of the Neurotrauma Committee, WFNS 2021-2023, uh, and a member of ACNS Win Committee uh, uh, together with us. So uh, I'd like to uh, welcome her and... Um, would like her to, uh, she will be speaking on her topic, will be um, managing neurosurgical cases in resource poor setting, challenges, perioperative planning and techniques. Okay, May, you can uh, take the screen, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Sharon. I'm so happy to see you. And um, I'll say good afternoon to everyone. It's afternoon here in Nigeria. Um, let me just uh, get my screen ready to share. Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Too. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much um, for this opportunity to speak. I want to use the opportunity to thank um, Professor Yokukato for this great opportunity. Um, thank you for your interest in the collaboration between Asia and Africa. Uh, we, we young neurosurgeons are really looking up to you <laughs> and to our other senior neurosurgeons here. Professor Atul Goyal, thank you. It was great listening to your lecture this morning and um, I'm a great uh, fan of yours now. Uh, thank you for the time you came to Nigeria. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful time spent with you. Uh, you really did inspire me. Um, and I want to thank everyone for being a part of this program today. All right, I'll be taking another perspective to um, our practice of neurosurgery. I will try to make it very fast. I know we've spent some time here already, and I'll just be discussing managing neurosurgical cases in resource poor settings, the challenges that we face and the innovations that we make in the face of those challenges to ensure that we give the best to our patients and have good outcomes. Um, I know that uh, many centers um, across Sub-Saharan Africa would have different ways of tackling the challenges that they face. Uh, I'll just highlight a few from um, my own um, practice. In the words of Plato, necessity is the mother of invention. And we have seen that uh, practically in the field of neurosurgery. Uh, necessity brought about the use of shunts um, in the 
in the management of hydrocephalus. Um, and as a young neurosurgeon, both in training and in uh, post-graduation, I have read a lot of things in our neurosurgery textbooks, um, which I, I don't have access to in my practice. Um, for instance, I remember when I was in Cape Town, I spent six months in Cape Town and I saw uh, neuronavigation for the first time there. I got this from the internet, <laughs> this picture here from the internet. And of course, since I've returned back to Nigeria, I've not had the opportunity of using neuronavigation. But in the course of this discussion, I would uh, share with us a little technique that we use in being able to localize uh, intracranial lesions and um, to get them out. All right. Now, these are the usual requirements that we have, that we need in uh, managing our neurosurgical cases. Uh, neuroimaging is very, very important. And in the, um, in the lecture Kemi Badija gave, she, she spoke about how we are now beginning to have an increase in number of patients we see with vascular lesions. And that is because we now have um, more access or better access to uh, neuroimaging, CT scans and MRI. Uh, but the reality on ground is that quite a lot of times those CTs or MRIs may not be in the institution where you are practicing your neurosurgery. The, the, you may have to get your patients to go out for those investigations and come back to you. So um, this is a very important um, challenge that we have in the management of our neurosurgical cases. And I will tell you how we have been able to overcome it in my own institution. You will agree with me that to also have to do your neurosurgical case, you need to have an operating table uh, that you know, is CM compatible, especially if you do lots of spine and has uh, the ability for you to attach your head to uh, also You know, of uh, the we have able to achieve what we want. Okay, um, neuronavigation. Um, me, you got disconnected. Me, your your screen, you, your screen went off, and you're muted. Can't hear you. You're muted. You have to unmute yourself. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, but you need to reshare your screen. Okay, good. Uh, the Wi Fi, yeah. Uh, sorry about the network. It's part of the challenges we face. And um, <laughs> all right. So I'll just quickly run through um, the challenges that we have and the innovations that we have uh, done to be able to overcome those challenges. Um, for instance, I mentioned neuroimaging outside the hospital premises. And in my center, what we have done is to organize a hospital transport system. Um, to help take up outside of the usual ambulance to help take our patients for the imaging, neuroimaging, and then bring uh, them back. We don't to have the hospital. Screen. We can't see your screen. Oh, okay. Give me a moment, please. Just a moment, please. All right. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Sure. Okay. All right. Can you see? Yes, we can see. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, so I mentioned about um, organizing hospital transport system to take our patients out for images and bring them back. Um, 
when we are doing um, surgeries that require the patients to be in prone positions, right? We um, have improvised using these bolsters. I hope you can see it on my screen. So you can see the bolsters that we use. Um, where our trained, um, we used to use pillows. We would compress the pillows, tie them around with gauze to be so that when the patient lies on it, it does not compress any further. Um, but in my institution now, instead of pillows, we use these bolsters that um, was created with the help of a local um, carpenter who used um, some strong foam material and then covered it with Macintosh material, which is impermeable to uh, fluids. Okay, and then, um, and you can see the bolsters there. Our tables, um, we, this table here that you can see in the screen is not a CM compatible table and it is manually operated. So when we need to do um, spine cases, um, that require us to do a, a PA view, we improvised by using these glass sheets. This is, well, kind of dangerous, but it, it was the only thing we could use. So you can see this glass sheet here that we placed on the table and connected to another uh, strong uh, um, iron uh, uh, stand so that we can now place the patient on it. And this will help us to be able to do, uh, to get a PA view. Well, now we do have a CM compatible table, but even at that, we have to be careful how we position our patient because this um, middle, uh, We need insurance call people and um, issues, and that has been of help to us. The microscope you see here in the picture, um, my my uh, senior colleague had to buy this with his own personal phone so that we can use it for our patients. And he got this from India, way cheaper than um, what we get from the European companies. Um, and so most times we have had to be able to get our instruments by ourselves. And um, I must acknowledge the effort of WFNS in helping young neurosurgeons to get instruments. Um, but I, I, I know that the process can be a little bit tedious. Um, and in Nigeria, I don't know how many uh, neurosurgeons have been able to get instruments from the WFNS um, uh, uh, process. Um, so lots of us have to buy our instruments by ourselves uh, from personal phones. And well, that is what we need to do to be able to move ahead. Now I'll go to a little bit more technical aspect of the innovations we have um, done in managing our patients. Now on this um, slide, you can see when you want to replace your bone flap after your craniotomy, um, people would use the cranial fixed materials. You can see it on this side. These cranial fixed materials can be quite uh, expensive. And for most of our patients, you know, that's, they, they pay out of pocket. So that's extra expenses for them. So instead of using cranial fix, what do we do? We use a vicro mesh. Now look at this picture very closely. You can see the vicro across the bone flap, but underlying that bone flap, you, we have a mesh of vicro too running across from the gilia to the gilia on the other side. And then we place the bone flap on it and then use the vicro again to keep it secure over the um, mesh before we close the, the scalp. So these are some of the innovations that we do to you know, reduce costs for our patients and um, give them the best outcomes that we can. Yeah, you can take a closer look at the picture. This here is that vicro strand, the vicro mesh that goes under the, um, the bone. I'm, I apologize, I don't have a picture of showing you the mesh itself before we put the bone on it, okay? But we use this vicro mesh across the craniotomy defect, and then we'll now place the bone flap on it before we close. This next slide is um, a little adaptation that I made for uh, patients with chronic subdural hematoma. Now we all know that 
um, the most common procedure for chronic subdural hematoma is the use of the borehole. Um, but in my time in, in, in Cape Town in South Africa, um, I, that was where I realized that you could use your craniotome to do a small, they call it a coin craniotomy, just a small craniotomy about 5 cm wide in its widest diameters so that you can have enough uh, room to clear out the fluid in subdural space and lavage the space um, um, uh, appropriately or properly um, beyond what you would do with um, either the single or the double ball home. Um, when I go back to Nigeria, of course, I don't have a craniotome yet. Uh, I hope to get one soon. So um, when I have patients that I would prefer to do a craniotomy for instead of a ball home, I decided to do this um, to use this method where you enlarge the ball home with your bone nibbler to just about 2.5 to 3 centimeter um, craniotomy, craniectomy defect, okay? And I do this under the temporalis muscle so that when I'm done, at least I have the temporalis muscle to cover up over that defect, you know, and then I'm able to do um, a good washout of the, um, of the subdural space afterwards. So these are some of the little innovations that we make uh, to help in, the, in our practice for our patients. Finally, I will talk about um, how we do localization of intracranial lesions um, um, without the aid of neural navigation. And um, basically what we do is the, the, the basic and um, All right. Um, what we do is what is the obvious um, anatomic landmark that you can use in our patients? Of course, in our training, we know you can use the coronal suture, um, you can use the external hospital protuberance, but a very obvious anatomic landmark that we can use in our patients is what the ear. You can see the ear on the patient, and you can also see the ear or the auditory canal on your imaging. And so you can use um, that anatomic landmark in relation to the lesion to be able to identify where the lesion is in the brain. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a few uh, minutes. For instance, this is a young boy, 13 year old, that has this para uh, false sign lesion. It's quite small, about 1.9 by two uh, centimeters in its widest diameters, really quite small. Um, but if we want to um, localize this, good, let me stop there. Now, this here is the um, auditory canal, right? And then we can, from here, count the number of slides it will take us to get to the lesion. Okay, when we count that, each slide is five millimeter thickness. So when you do that, you're able to know how many centimeters above the external auditory meatus or the auditory canal is the lesion, all right? And then you can also identify how much in front of the um, auditory canal it is or how far behind the auditory canal it is. So you just make a relationship of that lesion to the anatomic landmark that you can see. And with that, we have been able to accurately localize lesions, whether they're um, intraaxial or extra extraaxial, we're able to um, accurately localize the relationship of that lesion um, to the external auditory canal, to the external auditory meatus or the auditory canal in, in more than 90% of our cases. And like in this patient, we did this about um, two months ago, we were able to accurately pick that lesion. It was quite small. Um, so we eventually had to use intraoperative ultrasound to help us get it. Um, but at least our craniotomy was right over where the lesion was. And um, this was very, this has been very helpful for us in localizing lesions without the aid of um, neural navigation in our practice. And uh, I think with this, I will come to the end of my presentation. I will just conclude by saying that innovation 
uh, is very, very vital in our practice of neurosurgery, um, despite the economic challenges that we face, the economic realities that we see. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, me, for your uh, excellent presentation. Um, it's nice to know that you have to modify and um, be innovative. I think um, that's how a lot of us uh, become good neurosurgeons in some way, learning to be innovative. That's a personality trait. Uh, would anyone like to comment, Prof. Kato? Oh, thank you very much, Opara. Uh, uh, very nice uh, presentation. Uh, maybe uh, the, before me, maybe Alexander? Please. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Kato. Thank you very much for uh, so uh, really while I was listening to this pre presentation, I reminded a lot of things from my from my youth when I started. It was a post-Soviet time, and we also we were, we had no equipment. We it was we had no instruments uh, and. Uh, uh, everything was based on on the enthusiasm and uh, that's all so i have some advices for you to you uh, because we passed this way maybe 30 40 years back uh first of all the neurosurgery must be developed uh, in system not by by separated uh, specialization what what you what what you must do is to develop your political system in your countries to fight against corruption to develop uh, democracy because this is the base of normal medical care for your citizens uh, from other from other hand the next uh, what we must do we must uh, your neurosurgeons you must, must be together you must have the public organization and you must express all the needs uh, uh, of your community to your government to your government so you must uh, if you will be separated you are such in the country no one will 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 be able to hear you you must have a strong and active association even you are or five or ten ten in country anyway you are all together you are association so my strong advice to, to be together, to be organized um, legally, to have a status of organization. It's very important for to, uh, to develop. The next step is the development of uh, medical infrastructure, structure, which is the next step when your government will take care about uh, medical care of uh, people in your, your country. And I think the main component, the leading component is uh, the personal activity of uh, neurosurgeons. If you are, if you are intolerant, if you are apathic, you will never uh, move on. From my experience, what we do, what we did, we uh, contacted, first of all, we, we contacted with our colleagues from developed countries in terms of get to get some instruments. And everywhere we, we collected all to, together this instrument from all over the world. They sent us, we asked them, uh, you tr we tried to replace the uh, very expensive uh, equipment. Uh, for example, in my OR still even now, I have a copy of a retraction system, which cost more than $20,000. My hospital couldn't buy it. But I ordered it, uh, absolute copy, from the guys at the factory, they do not do not nothing for medical care for med for medical equipment, but they they made it and they still work for many many years. It's a, a copy of Spider Two uh, in my OR. So this is also the way, and also of course uh, you to be inventive and uh, always try to replace uh, um, uh, expensive consumable uh, things. I remember one article I read many years ago, and there was a, um, some meeting in Colombia, and a local uh, professor presented some very complex case, uh, which was he operated on with a minimum of instruments. And uh, one and the American guest professor told, "Oh, if I did it in my country with such a pure uh, equipment, I'd go to prison." And he was replied uh, from Colombian guy. He told, if I didn't do, I'd go to prison too. <laughs> so um, uh, I wish you 
prosperity. I wish you your development and uh, I wish you to build up the good neurosurgical service in your country. So all the best. Thank you, Professor Alexander. I think that's a very good uh, advice. Um, yeah, no, it's not easy, I'm sure, me, but uh, yeah, you've done a lot of innovation, so we are proud of you. All right, I hope you you stay strong, and uh, we'll also uh, hope to continue collaborating with you all. All right, and then um, you know, assisting you all whenever you all need any assistance. Of course, thank. You. I'm ready. Please, <laughs> I'm, I'm always open for uh, conversation. Thank you. Um, so I think there's one, is there Dr. Asene, you want to say something? Yes, uh, Sharon, thank you so much. Uh, uh, it's an honor for me to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, May just did a very brilliant presentation. And these are some of the challenges that we face uh, here in Africa, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, besides what she mentioned, most of our patients, first of all, there are a lot of delays. They take a lot of time for them to even come to the hospital. When they arrive at the hospital, there's a lot of delay in providing them the care that they need. And you, when you have to provide, provide the care, you know, you have the infrastructures are very limited. Sometimes we don't get the up-to-date technology, which maybe you might have in settings like in Japan, in India, Turkey, and other countries in Asia. And just to extend to what uh, Landry said, Landry gave a very brief, a very good overview of the situation in Africa. I think uh, the, we are learning a lot from, from Asia. We have now a very strong young neurosurgeons forum and Professor Kato, has been very supportive. I mean, she, I think there are a lot of young Africans that have traveled to Japan to learn from her. And besides that, she provides a lot of grants and financial support to the Young Neurosurgeons Forum. So we sincerely appreciate that. We're facing a lot of challenges. I think the two main areas at the moment are maybe getting uh, uh, equipments, just as Landry was saying, the consumables, sometimes very difficult to get them. And maybe in the nearest future, we might have to collaborate with Asia to see how we can get some of their low-cost effective uh, uh, consumables and equipments to to africa and then another area which we also need to work on is i know you know uh, asia is doing very well in terms of research you know compared uh, with respect to other uh, settings like north america and europe so we actually i mean i was uh, invited to the editorial board of the asian journal and at the moment we're actually working on a journal for africa because uh, african journal of neurosurgery because we didn't have one so i think we uh, can collaborate, there are a lot of areas in which we can actually collaborate and we can even go beyond to do maybe multi-center studies, which I was discussing with Sachin, the chair of the Asian Young Neurosurgeons Forum. So I think we have many things which are similar and we can really do a lot. So we're looking forward to really working with you and especially the young neurosurgeons because uh, these are the people who are actually active and with the supervision of the seniors like the Professor Kato and, and the others in the continent. I think we're going to do a lot between the two continents. So thank you so much. Uh... Thank you so much, SNA. Um, I think uh, we are actually short of time. I don't want, I think we've always stepped into the uh, nurses uh, webinar. So I'd like to thank uh, all of you for joining us today. Um, all our three uh, African speakers, Kemi, Landry and me, thank you so much uh, for giving us an insight uh, just a, a starting insight into uh, how things are in Africa. We really appreciate it. And um, yes, of course, like uh, from Asia, we were there and now we're moving on. So hopefully we can lend our uh, experiences to you all. Um, Prof. Kato, any uh, last? Uh... Oh, it's fine. I think uh, maybe uh, in the very near future, maybe we have some uh, another webinar or another discussion uh, through the, the Zoom. Then we can have a more uh, important uh, the, the problem we can discuss for the discussion. Okay. Uh, right. Thank you very much. Hey, Wonderful yeah. session. Okay, thank you very much and uh, have a good Sunday. Christine, are you taking over, Christine? I'll be taking over. Good afternoon, everyone. Good, good, afternoon. Afternoon. good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Professor, Good afternoon. Uh, President ACNS, Matron Eat, President ACNS, ACNN in her absence, Professor Malabhaskar Rao and Professor Lee Juan, session chairs, our invited speakers and commentators and dear participants, a warm greetings from ACNN. I welcome all of you to this ACNN webinar on epilepsy surgeries and nursing implications. Myself, Shani, I'm hosting today's uh, webinar 
nursing session in the absence of matron E and our co-host is Mrs. Kristin. Now I invite Professor Kato to say, say a few words as opening remarks. Ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Shani. Uh, yes, ma'am. Again, uh, we are very proud of uh, the uh, having the nurse uh, session again and after the wind session. And I think uh, we need to collaborate uh, with that your uh, support or the taking care of the patients. Uh, I think uh, uh, as a neurosurgeon, the, your role and the, your ability is very, very expecting and very important. So the, today is Professor Yamamoto uh, from Japan. Uh, he is a great uh, the epileptic neurosurgeon. So we all are expecting, ex expecting his, his talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Pro. The scheme of today's webinar is we'll be having an initial talk by Professor uh, Takamchi Yamamoto on recent advances in epilepsy surgeries for 30 minutes, followed by discussion led by um, Professor Alexander Ozinyak and Professor Joji Inamshu for 10 minutes. And the center session will be chaired by Professor Malafaska Rao. After the closing remarks by Professor Rao, we'll be having a nursing session chaired by Professor Lee Juan in which Dr. Manju Dandabani will be elaborating the care of uh, patients after epilepsy surgery, nurses' perspective, and Mrs. Renu Kumari will describe the care with reference to a case, 15 minutes each. After the comments and closing remark, uh, we will end uh, today's session. To introduce, uh, globally, around 50 million people have epilepsy, and among 10 to 15 million are living in India and nearly one third of people uh, with epilepsy are having drug resistant epilepsy. The first epilepsy surgery in India was performed uh, by um, Dr. Jacob Chandi in 1952 uh, in CMC Velour, simply reading the EEG, and later in 1954 uh, by Dr. Ramamurthy in Chennai. Uh, yeah, actually, during in 1960s, this institute used the stereotactic techniques also and followed by uh, several hundred surgeries being performed in these two centers. But as in the rest of the world, the epilepsy surgery fell into disrepute um, in India also because of poor uh, results as a result of improper localization of the lesion. This epilepsy surgery requires advanced pre-surgical evaluation in addition to the standard intervention from trained neuroscience team, including neurologists, neurosurgeon, neuroradiologists, and psychologists. Of course, a neurointensive care unit with the well-trained nurses. And this better localization of epileptogenic focus by newer diagnostic techniques resulted in the resurgence of epilepsy surgery in worldwide in 90s. And in 1995, in India, two modern epilepsy centers were started, uh, one in uh, Srijitha Tirunal Institute for Medical Science and Technology, Trivandrum, that is in South India, and one in Ames, New Delhi. These two centers, um, uh, were now also functioning as a very in advanced uh, model or advanced manner. In the center of comprehensive epilepsy care center in Sri Jitra, the epilepsy surgeon was none other than Dr. Malla Bhaskar Rao, who had undergone his training in neurosurgery and epilepsy surgery initially uh, from Dr. Yamamurthy and later from uh, various centers. He modified the standard protocol, which suits the local conditions and established a low cost and effective epilepsy surgery program. The first patient was operated in 1995, which is the case of measles temporal sclerosis. After that, epilepsy surgery gained momentum and many centers are now treating surgically remediable epilepsy with good outcome. With this introduction, I welcome Dr. Bhaskar Rao to chair the session. Being a nurse working in the same institute, I'm really honored and humbled to introduce you, sir. Off to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, 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 <clears throat> thank you very much for the giving me this opportunity. Also, please uh, join me in congratulating the entire team for organizing this uh, very important uh, webinar. Now, uh, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce uh, our uh, uh, keynote speaker, Professor Taka Yamamoto, uh, MD, PhD, MS Fellow of the American Epilepsy Society, an accomplished uh, neurosurgeon and a dear friend of mine. So between 1980 to 1998, 
professor emamato studied uh, medicine and subsequently neurosurgery and worked as a staff at uh, hamamatsu university in japan later the next uh, six years that is from 1998 to 2004 he spent time in united states initially with uh, research and uh, clinical fellowships followed by a master's degree in advanced management program for clinicians upon returning to japan in 2004 up until 2022 that is for 18 years he claimed the step ladder and uh, currently uh, uh, reached the position of vice executive director at the uh, same institute where he was uh, trained amamatsu general hospital and uh, his current uh, position is vice executive director at the mikatahara general hospital in in japan so he is a diplomat of the uh, various boards japanese board of neurological surgery japanese board of epileptology japanese board of pediatric neurosurgery japanese board of strokeology fellow of the american epilepsy society japanese board of clinical neurophysiology his uh, contributions in the field of epilepsy surgery and pediatric neurosurgery as well as uh, contributions to the japanese epilepsy society uh, as well as uh, international epilepsy surgery society are outstanding i invite uh, professor emamoto to speak on the recent advances to on epilepsy surgery over to professor emamoto hi dr rao <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it's been a long time since uh uh IESS last year. <laughs> so uh uh I'm going to I'm going to uh share my uh video clip uh for presentation. I've just made a uh, uh, this video clip, but uh, it's it it is shorter than was expected. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, uh... it is a great honor for me to be invited this time. I'm going to talk about the recent advancement in epilepsy surgery towards less invasive procedure. Epilepsy surgery is now. Uh, rapidly changing as the following less invasive minimal resection and usable implantable devices for palliative treatment without excessive resection or disconnection this is a phases in epilepsy surgery if a patient does not respond to two or three anti seizure medications the patient's epilepsy is considered medically refractory then first of all Video EEG monitoring is scheduled to see if the patient is a surgical candidate or not. If the patient is a surgical candidate and needs more precise localization of the seizure focus, the patient will undergo invasive monitoring with intracranial electrodes. Subdural grids and strips have been used conventionally in Japan. Many hospitals have started to steer tactic EEG with the depth electrodes. On the other hand, the patient has a multiple seizure foci or generous epilepsy, the patient will undergo venous implantation. RNS and DVS will be the alternative options in the near future. Subdural grids and strips have been used. These electrodes have platinum contact on the silicon matrix and are put on the brain cortex. I will show you conventional placement of subdural grids and strips. Skin incision. We usually obtain the periosteum for geroplasty at the end of the surgery. The dura is opened.
H seven zero strip for the temple and low base, especially for the parahippocampal gyrus, was inserted. A subdural grid is also placed on the right temporal neocortex along the Suvian fissure. Closing the dura with a running stitch. And leads of the electrodes come through the scope. Cranial flap is put back to the space. Scalpel flap is also closed. This is a depth electrode. The diameter is very fine and less than one millimeter to prevent injury to blood vessels. Stereotactic EG SEG was created by John Tadalak. He and his staff established where the blood vessels were not, a vascular zones in which depth electrode could be passed orthogonally without a risk of intracerebral bleeding. Patient stayed for 6 to 12 hours in the operating room for invasive monitoring. If we perform SCG implantation with the depth electrodes, these head frames are necessary. If we have robotic access, such as a Rosa or Neuromate, implantation should be much easier. Preoperative MR angiography and a conventional cerebral angiography are performed. With these images together, electrode trajectories are safely planned, avoiding vascular structures. This is an example in which neurosurgical robot assisted the placement of depth electrodes successfully in a very small area, particularly in the left temporal lobe. This table shows the favor favored epilepsy types for SEG versus SDE techniques. However, most of the cases could be done by SEG. The only cortical lesion near the eloquent area should be indicated for subdural electrodes. This is a report from the University of Texas in a demonstrated comparison of the two groups, subdural electrodes versus SEG. OR time and surgery time are much shorter in SEG. The number of electrodes is much larger in SEG. Much less transfusion and much less narcotic use in SEG. In the same institute, the number of SEG is rapidly increasing. However, the number, number of subdural showed plateau. That means only a few cases were done by subdural electrodes. This is a survey of the United States tertiary referral epilepsy centers and demonstrated the preference of SEG in the temporal lobe epilepsy, suspected neocortical epilepsy, non-legional frontal lobe epilepsy, insular epilepsy, and the previous epilepsy surgery. This is a hippocampal sclerosis typically seen in patients with mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. I will show you conventional anteromedial temporal lobectomy, which is accepted worldwide. We normally start approach on the middle temporal gyrus, 3 to 4 cm from the tip of the temporal lobe, coagulate and cut the cortical surface, aspirate the middle and the inferior temporal gyri with the cusa and go down vertically. Then, in the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle is opened. The hippocampus is exposed in a whitish and a glittering appearance. 
A hippocampal electrode is inserted along the long axis of the hippocampus to see its epileptic activity. Continuous action around the hippocampus. The lower two thirds of the amygdala is aspirated, and uh, disconnection between the amygdala and the hippocampus is down. The fimbria is aspirated to see blood vessels in the hippocampal sulcus. At least a 2.5 centimeter of the hippocampus should be removed. Observe carefully both the vessels, coagulate and the cut arteries close to the hippocampus. Then the hippocampus is resected. Additional aspiration of the hippocampus and uh, the parahippocampal gyrus is still necessary to complete the resection. More resection of one centimeter is done. So Giselle is placed in the cavity. An anteromedial temporal lobectomy and the hippocampectomy is accomplished. This is laser ablation, which is used other than neurosurgery. A laser ablation spread explosively in the United States. This is done by day surgery, only with a hole smaller than a conventional bar hole. The last topic is vagus nerve stimulation, VNS. This is a case of venous implantation. The boy was referred to me as a venous candidate because he showed multiple types of seizures, multiple independent foci, and a genetic abnormality. A pediatric neurologist gave me consultation only one year from the beginning of a treatment with anti-seizure medications. Then VNS worked well and his seizures were almost suppressed. The inner muscles are retracted immediately and the coated sheath is exposed. The vagus nerve is seen between the common carotid artery and the internal jugular vein. The vagus nerve is pulled up gently. A vascular tape is passed through the membrane to secure 
the vagus nerve. Unnecessary membranes should be cut for placement of electrodes. The coil electrodes are placed on the vagus nerve. The negative electrode the positive electrodes and the anchor anchor tether the tape is cut Tie downs are used to uncur the lead. The cervical part is down. Then we move to the left precordium. Skin incision is done just anteriorly from the axilla. A pocket for the generator is made manually under the subcutaneous fat tissue. Tunneler is used to connect between the cervical area and the pocket. The lead is introduced and connected with the generator. The previous models of VNS have only the normal mode and the magnet mode. In addition, the latest generators obtain the auto stimulator responding to ictal tachycardia. The VNS has been ultimately equipped with a closed loop system. Before we use the auto stim mode, threshold of the sensitivity should be determined from 20% through 70% of increase in heart rate at the beginning of seizure events. This is an example of the auto stim mode. An EEG showed rhythmic theta activity over the right frontal temporal area. The threshold was 20%, and after 6 seconds from the seizure onset, automatic stimulation started. The seizure was aborted successfully. This is the results from the Japan study from 2010 through 2013 which accumulated the whole cases from the beginning and demonstrated 59.6% of our patients 
obtained more than 50% seizure reduction. However, generators were not the latest device. Then patients were treated only with the normal mode and the magnet mode. This report showed more efficacy in seizure reduction by the latest device with the closed-loop system. This paper summarized the data reported on patients who underwent the replacement of the generators from the traditional one to the latest one with the autostim mode. Kawaji and I reported previously and showed 41% of the patients got additional seizure reduction by replacement to the latest device. Take home. Movement towards less invasive procedures in epilepsy surgery is ongoing, as it is seen in other areas of neurosurgery. Subdural electrodes will be replaced by depth electrodes in most of the cases who need invasive evaluation and focus detection. Resections also will be replaced by laser ablation or radiofrequency thermocoagulation. However, it may be an issue for young neurosurgeons in terms of microsurgical education. VNS is still the mainstream in palliative options for patients with medical refractory epilepsy. Responsive neurostimulation, RNS, and the deep brain stimulation, DBS, will gain positions of palliative treatment in the near future. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, th th thank you very much uh, for a very uh, short and uh, sweet uh, presentation. Uh, may I invite uh, Professor uh, Alexander and Professor Josie for their comments, please? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Yamamoto, thank you very much for excellent lecture and uh, uh, real illustration of your words with the uh, excellent videos and uh, explanation. Thank you very much. I have a small question for you. Maybe you know the cost of uh, investigation, epilepsy uh, uh, patient in your country, uh, VNS, uh, uh, deep, brain, uh, deep brain electrodes, for relative, relative cost, because it's a problem for, especially for um, mid-income and low-income countries. So, do you know? Because... Yeah, I know. <clears throat> uh, the cost is, is very expensive uh, to buy these devices. Uh, it's, uh, particularly, we should, uh, we should buy these devices from the United States. And uh, mm -hmm. it costs uh, 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 so probably uh, equal to, to the uh, one motor vehicle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I know. I know. Yeah. Well, this is a big problem in my country because we mm. are not high income country. We are in in between middle and low somewhere, somewhere, somewhere that, and uh, we have uh, our way to to resolve this problem because anyway we must manage the patient. We must treat them, this patient, and. Uh, Mm. Now I switch. Uh, let me let me switch to the auditorium. Uh, okay, I will do like uh, my small uh, comments. So um, any um, epilepsy surgery is uh, divided to resectional, uh, disconnection, disconnection, resection, disconnection, uh, stimulation, and uh, ablation uh, procedures. Uh, it's very interesting that the resection, the least, uh, the least. Um, expensive and in general is more effective still now till now uh, and in our practice we always try to find the candidates for resective surgery especially it's associated with uh, some lesion visible on mri and this uh, uh, surgery is usually is the most effective and uh, um, we have a, the best result in this patient, but the problem is candidates for this surgery. So when the, when we cannot use resection, when we cannot use disconnection, we we move forward to uh, to all the stimulating procedures, which are very expensive, 
and uh, mm, less effective in general if to compare with resectional. But the problem is that we cannot use the resection for all the patient epileptic surgery. Uh, so this like uh, about the if, if you speak about surgery. And now I want to speak to the nurses. The nurses about the mission of nurses in management of epilepsy patients. Uh, there is a worldwide problem for epileptic uh, patients uh, to, in, there's a problem with contact with doctors. According to statistics, about 40, 50% of epilepsy surgeries, uh, epilepsy patients uh, had no ability to contact doctor for more than one year. It's a statistic, it's, a, it's a well, well, well established. And uh, in this term, the mission of um, nurse is very important. So because nurse is a linking part in between patient and between, between doctor. In the developed country, countries, there are special organization of uh, epilepsy nurses, like in US, like in UK, in France, there are specialized nurses, which uh, even have different levels in the hierarchy of this, from the beginners to the expert nurses, which can, which can administrate the anti-epileptic drugs, which can even choose the way of um, treatment of the patient. So the another group of no nurses, the nurses in the uh, general department. They also must be well educated what to do with epilepsy patient. And the next uh, group of uh, nurses, uh, the nurses which work in, in um, uh, specialized department, neurosurgical specialized department. But uh, what the most important mission of the, of this nurses, the nurses who work in rural uh, um, regions and on the first level of medical uh, medical care, the level of family doctors. So they they just they are in good contact with patients. They can explain the patients that's how it's important to uh, to have an anti epileptic uh, anti epileptic uh, therapy. They can explain the patients um, that uh, every next uh, every, every next seizure uh, leaves the, some neurological deficit, which finally will summarize it and go to the uh, mental deterioration of the patient. So, in this term, so I uh, really grateful to organizers. They, they found the way they organized this webinar to focus uh, the attention of uh, education of nurses, uh, how to manage, and how to, uh, how to chat with the patient with epilepsy. So and thank you very much and congratulations to organizers of this uh, webinar. Thank you, Professor Zosi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. We can hear. Uh, my name is Dr. Inamasu from Tochigi, Japan. I'm a general neurosurgeon, not the epilepsy, epilepsy specialist. So uh, I, I'd like to ask Dr. Yamamoto or Professor Yamamoto about the uh, two questions from a general neurosurgic surgeon's view. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, first question is the uh, drug therapy before and after surgery. So usually the patient, the seizure patient are taking many multiple drugs, drugs and the, after the surgery, the patient are expected to reduce the number of, number of drugs. But the, after the operation, so you how to reduce the uh, number of the drug. So after the surgery, the patient can stop medication completely, or you, you reduce the drug one by one. Let me, le, let us know about it. Yes, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, as, as you said, uh, many patients with medical refractory epilepsy are taking uh, many medications, uh, at, least, uh, at least two or three uh, anti-seizure medications. And uh, after uh, successful surgery, uh, particularly temporal lobe resection, uh, 
we can we can reduce the number of uh, epileptic drugs uh, from uh, uh, three to three to one or uh, four to two. Uh, not not every time at the one by one, but uh, uh, so we we are uh, confident confident uh, with the result of epilepsy surgery. Uh, we can reduce uh, uh, more than one medications after surgery. Okay, uh, can I ask another question? Okay, please, please. So uh, I'm also from Japan, and in Japan there are several nursing specialties such as cancer care, or burn care, or um, infection care nurses. But oh. the, unfortunately. There is, until now, there is no epilepsy care nurses, specialist nurses in Japan. So how do you educate nurses in your department about the uh, epilepsy care, patient care? Yes, uh, this is also a very important uh, uh, issues uh, in, in our country. And then, uh, uh, some uh, meeting uh, uh, Japan, uh, such as Japan uh, Epilepsy, uh, Epilepsy Center uh, uh, meeting, meeting probably, uh, have some uh, educational uh, courses for uh, uh, nurses, is, uh, interested in uh, in epilepsy surgery but in my hospital I uh, sometimes uh, make uh, uh, lectures uh, once per, per month probably uh, to introduce epilepsy surgery from uh, uh, basic uh, basic knowledge of epilepsy through uh, epilepsy surgery uh, including uh, resections and the disconnections, and uh, also uh, Vegas nerve stimulation, that as you as you uh, as I uh, presented today. Uh, but uh, but uh, there's no uh, as you said, there's no uh, epilepsy epilepsy care nurses in the country. Thank you so much. Back to thank you, thank you, Professor, thank yeah, you, Professor thank you. Lau. Thank you. So it's a uh, uh, very interesting and uh, informative uh, uh, webinar, both uh, by the speaker as well as by the commentators. Uh, just few comments from my side. Uh, epilepsy surgery is different compared to uh, other neurosurgical procedures in two ways. First thing is in properly selected patients, epilepsy surgery completely cures the disease bringing a diseased person into a normal person. That is one important uh, difference. The second important uh, difference is that it is highly underutilized worldwide, all over the world. In uh, United States, only if there are 100 suitable candidates for epilepsy surgery, only, gets, only one gets uh, uh, to undergo pre-surgical evaluation and epilepsy surgery. In India, one in 1,000 one in thousand deserving candidates is undergoing the procedure. In Asia, there is a wide uh, uh, differences among the institutions. For example, in, in Japan, in Korea, in Taiwan, very advanced uh, epilepsy surgery is being practiced. But unfortunately, in the low and uh, middle income countries, the situation is completely different. Josie mentioned that uh, there are no trained epilepsy nurses Unfortunately, in many countries, there are no trained epilepsy surgeons also. So there is a lot of uh, uh, treatment gap is there. Uh, one, one, uh, one way is uh, to start uh, basic uh, epilepsy surgery units. Uh, Professor Alexander highlighted this uh, uh, very well, that uh, you have to identify simple cases where you can identify the lesion, identify the focus, with non-invasive evaluation, no invasive, so that it's very cost-effective, identification is very easy, surgery is standardized, and then outcome is assured. 
as institutions and teams develop experience expertise they can take up more and more difficult cases or they can simply refer cases to established uh, centers now i would like to ask taka a few questions uh, i'm sure uh, many young neurosurgeons from asia must have visited your center you have trained them and then maybe you must have conducted demonstration workshops outside japan in uh, low and middle income countries can you share your experience it's like uh, encouraging young surgeons encouraging new centers hand holding basically like a uh, uh, like a uh, an elderly person will guide a young person how to develop the program what is your experience oh <clears throat> no not not really i i didn't have any experience uh in uh in education for uh and your surgeons in in other countries uh uh we uh accept uh, some uh, young 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 neurosurgeons but uh not uh, not uh, asian asian countries I, i'm sure many people must be uh, uh, watching this webinar would you like to if someone approaches you would you like to offer <laughs> yeah <it>? yeah okay <laughs> i will <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you this the second point uh, just like mainstream neurosurgery epilepsy surgery is changing mm. you showed uh, very interesting uh, surgical procedures video of how, how to resect uh, hippocampus safely and if there is no resective surgery uh, how to uh, consider alternate uh, uh, options of palliative procedures mm. you mentioned about lit also but epilepsy surgery is changing in the next 10 15 20 years what we are doing currently is likely to change there are few examples all surgeries in neurosurgery all surgeries including epilepsy surgery will become more and more minimally invasive mm. there will be keyhole procedures mm. there are endoscopic procedures and in case if even resective surgery as such is coming down in united states i'm sure in europe then in uh, in asia also resective surgery will come down once lasers are available outside united states and europe usage of uh, laser ablations will increase and even in in place of lasers uh, radio frequency ablations are also being done and also in future even these things may also will come down because high frequency uh, high fu ultrasound focused ultrasound uh, is now indicated uh, for uh, lesions like uh, mts so and after genetics it's a, they, they are all evolving techniques so uh, please tell me you and other japanese neurosurgeons and epilepsy surgeons how do you keep up with changing times and what is your advice to young surgeons who are watching the webinar changing techniques in neurosurgery changing techniques in epilepsy surgery what is your advice to them yeah uh at this moment uh, uh mi microsurgical microsurgical resection or disconnection yes uh most important uh thing for young for young young neurosurgeons uh should should learn uh, first of all and because uh because uh, uh laser ablation or uh other uh, ther uh, uh coagulation also uh and not uh, not very difficult it, because you uh everything is uh everything is uh uh can be done by by the computer computer basis yeah, yeah. then uh uh we 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 do not have to think about uh, uh the surgical strategy then uh young neurosurgeons should learn uh, microsurgical technique first first of all and then yeah, uh yeah. And, yeah but but uh 
So many, many, many procedures are replaced by the less invasive procedures, but uh, uh, microsurgical technique should be necessary in, in, in our future. Uh, and then we should uh, keep and continue uh, education and uh, also uh, uh, refinement of our, of our techniques. Thank you. Uh, my last uh, comment uh, is uh, regarding uh, uh, supporting and encouraging uh, new centers to come up and work as a team. Uh, Asian uh, Congress of Neurological Surgeons and uh, 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 people like uh, Professor Yako Kato and uh, several other seniors, uh, they, they are doing their best to, 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 to encourage, to popularize neurosurgery in general, epilepsy surgery also in particular in some places. Uh, all over Asia. Now, uh, I just want to give an example about the European Epilepsy Brain Bank. Maybe uh, uh, Professor Alexander also can add a bit. So, uh, 12,000 uh, epilepsy surgery specimens uh, are kept in Germany. Uh, these uh, 12,000 epilepsy surgery specimens were collected from epilepsy surgery centers all over the Europe. All specimens will go to one centralized bank. You know what uh, great advantage uh, uh, is there? The new classification is coming. Like Just like we have glioma has got a genetic component, like that focal cortical dysplasia with the genetic component, new classification is coming. Outcome studies are being changed based on this data bank. Uh, there was a question about uh, reducing the anti seizure medication. Which, medici which medication is effective? Which medication has to be, we can taper and stop? Which medication has to be continued over a long period of time? All this knowledge is generated out of the European Epilepsy Brain Bank. I wish in future, maybe the centers in uh, Asia also can consider some sort of uh, uh, coordinated uh, uh, action in terms of uh, epilepsy service, epilepsy training, epilepsy research. I'm sure hundreds and thousands of uh, deserving patients will benefit uh, with this sort of initiative. And uh, Professor Alexander, would you like to uh, add any comment uh, regarding? I'm sure Thank you, you must... <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Professor Rao. Thank you very much for your excellent comment and thank you for the questions. Uh, really, my department is all involved in this process of collecting the specimens from the patients, uh, though only the tumor, only the tumors, uh, not not hypocampus, just just tumors. We send it to the to, to the bank to the. I think it goes to. UK maybe maybe so there is a company which uh, take the specimens and uh, transfer the, to the the uh, really we are on the um, on the border on the threshold uh, of new, absolutely new uh, conceptions for management of intracranial lesions uh, not only gliomas but all but any any kinds of uh, so because uh, the modern uh, system of therapy of, of intracranial the tumors, uh, you know, it uh, cannot uh, say it's effective. It's uh, mostly palliative. Our surgery, the uh, radiotherapy and uh, chemotherapy, uh, especially for glioblastoma. Of course, uh, the scientists are looking for the targets for the, for the therapeutic uh, for the therapeutic. Uh, implementation of the different uh, different uh, medic medicine different drugs so but uh, unfortunately for nowadays we have not so many effective uh, medicines for this conception conception is very good conception is very uh, progressive and more for but we are on the on the, on the beginning of of uh, this process and we uh, we have to who stay at the previous uh, the previous positions in uh, in management of our patients in management of intracranial tumors as well as the management of epilepsy patients with uh, associated with lesional uh, process but um, 
my so what what I'd, I'd wish what I'd uh, recommend to all of us uh, just to um, make any possible com contribution to this process pro to the process of development for new conception for treatment of of, the, of this of uh, intracranial uh, neoplasm intracranial tumors uh, uh, at least uh, to to send more and more specimens to the this uh, big bank at the first stages because as we are not genetics because uh, the biologist and genetics uh, then will will analyze uh, this specimens and i believe that uh, the um, artificial the intellect au will be applied to analyze all the all the obtained data and uh, i believe that in the future in future we will have more and more effective uh, uh, drugs for medicine for treatment of our patients. Yeah. So thank you. That's yeah. my that is my comment. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. My my last and final comment. Uh, this is uh, maybe uh, towards uh, uh, encouraging our nursing colleagues to uh, take it up and have more interest in epilepsy work. So there's a saying that the strength of the chain is equal to the weakest link. So epilepsy is a teamwork. Many people are involved, uh, 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 neurologist, epileptologist, neurosurgeon, radiologist, psychologist, social, uh, all, all from social work. So uh, nursing care is of crucial importance. If you, if you can uh, convince your institution that you want to specialize, you want to go to a center where epilepsy work is being done, get trained and then come back and establish a epilepsy service, it's highly rewarding. You, you can see children cannot go to schools. Mm, they cannot get educated. They cannot get jobs subsequently. They cannot get married. And they'll have a lot of uh, social, psychosocial problems. Once the disease is cured by surgery or even attempts by devices and with proper medication, they become normal, absolutely normal. It's a, it's a, it's a very rewarding work for entire team. And... Uh, Intellectually, from scientific point of view, it is uh, very stimulating to the brain. If you understand epilepsy, you will understand the brain, how brain works. So it's very, from uh, uh, industrialized countries like uh, 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 US and Europe, consider uh, all the money spent for people with epilepsy as an investment. It's not expenditure. So it's investment so that uh, the, uh, the net benefit of the society is enormous once the, the disease is cured. I hope uh, this uh, uh, webinar will uh, stimulate interest uh, among uh, the participants, uh, many doctors and uh, our young nursing colleagues, and then hopefully it will help uh, uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, people suffering with uh, epilepsy. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I, I think uh, back to uh, the uh, Dr. Shani for closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you uh, for explaining about epilepsy surgeries and the significance of nursing care. Uh, so now we can move on to the nursing session. Uh, we could understand that the epilepsy surgery includes an array of procedures. All the cranial surgeries carry a risk of complications with epilepsy surgery. The postoperative care demands on the area, uh, care depend on mainly on the area of brain being operated the pre-procedure cognitive and behavioral status, and a lot of other parameters. The overall outcome of patient and satis patient satisfaction depend on skilled nursing care in the immediate post-operative period. These surgeries are um, being performed in super specialty centers, and graduate nurses are seldom get opportunity to learn care of these patients. So we can move on to the second session. For that, I welcome Ms. Christian to introduce and invite Professor Lee Juan to chair the second session. Okay, thank you, Sunny. Uh, good evening for all. So with that, we will go ahead to the second session. Please, Professor Rijuan, as a chair in the second session. Before that, I will introduce her CV. Professor Rijuan is Associated Professor in Nation Center for Neurologic Disorders of China Huasan Hospital, Fudan University. For Professor uh, Li Juan, time is yours. Uh, thank you very much, 
Christine. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Yoko Kanto. Good evening, everyone. It's my great honor to be here to be the uh, chair of the second session. Uh, first, uh, let me introduce the next speaker. Uh, can you see my screen now? Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, now I would like to uh, introduce next speaker, uh, Dr. Manju. Then, then, <laughs> Dr. Manju. Uh, uh, then the penny. <laughs> if I didn't uh, pronounce uh, your name correctly, please forgive me. Uh, Dr. Manju is an associate professor. Nas uh, in National Institute of Nursing Education, Pajama. She is the Vice President of Society of India Neuroscience Nurses. Uh, she has a Bachelor Degree of Nursing, Master's Degree of Neuroscience Nursing and Sociology, and a PhD in Nursing. She has worked uh, as a neuroscience nurse at all India Institute of Medical Science uh, faculty in our India Institute of Medical Science uh, and other uh, 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 and other institute, she has uh, she has got uh, so many uh, achievements, yes. such as uh, the the runner up finalist top ten for Esther Global Nursing Award two thousand twenty one. The best publication award annual research day 2022 globally selected among 100 nurses by well, women in global health in collaboration with WHO, founder director of virtual stroke nursing courses by SINN. She has developed stroke nursing guidelines for nurses in, in India and uh, some other awards. Uh, now she uh, is the course director of stroke nursing certificate course and a national trainer for elderly and palliative care for PhD and on PhD medical officials. Uh, her research uh, focuses on brain tumor, pituitary tumor, traumatic brain injury, and stroke and other areas. She also has published and gave lectures and uh, do uh, and did some presentations in international conferences. Uh, today, her topic is uh, post epilepsy surgery care from nursing perspective. Uh, welcome, Dr. Manju. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you for introducing me. I'm really humbled with your introduction. And uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank. Uh, the ACNN team, uh, Maitre Nhi Chang and uh, Professor Yokomoto and uh, Dr. Shani and the team for inviting me for giving me uh, giving this lecture on postoperative care on epilepsy. And uh, just let me uh, share my slide. Is the slide visible? Not yet, sir. Yes. yes it's okay. A yeah. Difference. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, so far we have heard about epilepsy surgery and the types of epilepsy surgery, and uh, from sir. And uh, uh, now we will be. We know that the nurses have a great role. Actually, after the pre pre previous day, also we were discussing about the same. Nurses have great role in the preoperative assessment and counseling and postoperative care and uh, long term rehabilitation of these patients because they have many aspects where nurses play a major role. So I Manju Dandabani will be talking about the same. So we know that epilepsy surgery is performed to treat to treat seizures that cannot be controlled by medications as medically uh, drug-resistant uh, epilepsy or uh, refractory epilepsies. Usually it is done as an invasive procedure under general anesthesia through a craniotomy or before, and duration is, can be a few hours to uh, a week, uh, and the hospital stay can be up to a week or more and uh, the recovery can go up to several months. And the surgical candidates for epilepsy surgery are uh, medically refractory seizures or drug resistant epilepsy, where there's failure of two tolerated and appropriately chosen and used 
anti-epileptic drugs. And patients are having impairment of quality of life due to ongoing seizures or any episode of status epilepticus anytime, even if seizures are well controlled on two drugs. So there are various types of surgery, though most commonly done is surgical resection or the uh, resection of the temporal lobe or the uh, temporal lobectomy. So the surgery under surgical resection category, we have lesionectomy, lobectomy, multilobar resection, or hemispherectomy. And under disconnection surgical techniques, uh, where we cut the communication between the area of the brain area of brain that is generating seizures and the normal brain tissue, such as brain uh, corpus callosotomy uh, or multiple sapial resection, which are usually considered when the area where seizures are occurring can't be safely removed. So uh, we also have options of minimally invasive surgeries, uh, which are shorter, uh, ha having shorter duration, less tissue damage, shorter hospital stay and quick recovery. And uh, they include stereotactic radio surgery, laser industri industrial thermal therapy and neuromodulation options. In stereotactic surgeries, we have uh, we are using 3D computerized imaging to precisely focus radiation beams on a target to destroy the nerve cells that are causing the seizures without destroying the normal tissue. In a laser interstitial thermal therapy, the laser energy is transmitted to a focused area uh, where uh, the uh, he, laser energy is converted to heat energy and destroy the epileptogenic foci. And under neuromodulation, we have three types of surgeries that can be performed. One is vagus nerve stimulation, which is been already explain, explained by Professor Yamamoto. And we have responsive neurostimulation where uh, we play, we can place an uh, electrode and, uh, uh, and the pulse generator over the brain and uh, which can sense the initiation of the seizures and stop immediately. And another option is deep brain stimulation where an electrode is being implanted in the brain with a pulse generator in a pouch in the chest, chest wall. So, uh, but we know that uh, neuromodulation and other uh, minimally invasive surgeries are mm, not often done uh, in many centers. Uh, most commonly done procedure is uh, lobectomy mm, or the uh, lesionectomies. Uh, so uh, it is very important for a, a thorough preoperative assessment so that we can precisely uh, localize this uh, epileptogenic foci and go ahead with the surgery. So the preoperative, uh, in, you know, like identification of the candidate for surgery is mainly to locate where the seizures begin in the brain. Nurses should have knowledge on all these aspects so that they will be able to counsel, provide psychological support, prepare the patient for surgery, and also monitor the patients during the postoperative phase and compare the uh, patient's postoperative status with the preoperative status and so that they can be appropriately rehabilitated and uh, that can help in improving the quality of life and their activities of daily living. So as I told, the identification include to locate where the seizures begin in the brain to determine if the identified area of brain tissue can safely be removed or if communication between brain areas can be safely disabled to determine the vital functions that are controlled near the brain area where the seizures start, to help predict the outcome after surgery, whether um, a polytherapy can be stopped or uh, we can change to monotherapy and in what time we can stop the AEDs. And uh, there are mainly two levels of pre-surgical testing, which includes, uh, but for the purpose of temporal lobectomy, we may not go up to the phase two testing uh, or the assessment before surgery. So in the phase one test, which are familiar, which include EEG, uh, in-hospital video EEG, PET scan, uh, it can be uh, in rectal PET scan and SPEC scan and uh, neuropsychological evaluation detailed by a neuropsychologist uh, with the help of functional MRI to assess the verbal skills, memory function and learning skills, which also serve as a baseline. Uh, for measuring and comparing and even planning the postoperative care and their long-term rehabilitation. A functional MRI test measures brain activity while performing a cognitive function and other, other function. And other tests, uh, tests like uh, MGE and uh, MEG and WADA tests are not done. 
And uh, this is the picture of video EG where we get the uh, EG monitoring along with the patient's activity. So that which help us to, uh, which has been recorded by a video camera. So which will help us to localize the lesion better. There's the functional MRI showing the localization of uh, various brain uh, area, which is uh, activated during various cognitive functions. This is a PET scan, uh, uh, which can identify the hypermetabolism, which is happening in the epileptogenic power, okay, in, during the interictal phase. And in SPECT scan also can identify hyperperfusion in, during ictal phase and hyperperfusion in uh, interictal phase. So in phase two, test include uh, the invasive EEG and brain mapping. Uh, so uh, invasive EEG where the electrode placements on the surface of the or deep into the brain, uh, where it can be SEEG, like uh, we have just heard about it in the previous lecture and functional brain mapping. So uh, also can be uh, done uh, even during the surgery to navigate the uh, location of the epileptogenic focke. Uh, but in our center, they are not doing it. So uh, invasive evaluations uh, can be uh, done when uh, the uh, when we are not getting a proper idea or we are not able to localize the epileptogenic 4K through functional uh, MRI and PET or SPEC scan. So, uh, so as I told already, a thorough preoperative assessment is very, very important. And the rest of the preoperative care include uh, something similar to any other surgery like informed written consent, pre-anesthesia checkup, psychological preparation, blood arrangement, chest x-ray, CG lab investigations, and detailed clinical assessment, and nil by mouth, etc., etc. So here when the patients are uh, informed or the caregivers or family members informed about the surgery, they should not be expecting that, okay, after the surgery, immediately they'll become seizures free. Uh, which can be even more trauma, tra be a trauma for the patient. So we need to clearly explain based on the literature what is the possibility of for them to become the seizures uh, uh, free, and what about the possibility of continuing with uh, the existing AEDs or uh, reducing the AEDs or and uh, expected postoperative complications. And a thorough psychological preparation is needed so that the patients are uh, able to cope up with the procedure and the postoperative outcome. So now coming to the intraoperative care, uh, here we receive the patient in OT and general anesthesia is given part after the part preparation. Uh, Indra or PEG, as I told, maybe some of the centers may be doing it, but in our center we are not doing, which can further navigate or like uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, surgeon uh, to uh, localize the lesion. And uh, then surgical resection is done. Uh, brain mapping uh, is done. After reversing the patient in the OT only uh, to know uh, if the uh, resection is correct or complete. Uh, and uh, again, a patient's uh, the drain placement will be done and closure will be done. And we can see the positioning where the head is rotated contralaterally 50 degrees and extended 30 degrees, where the OT nurse has a role in assisting so that the patients are protected. All the safety measures are taken while positioning the patient. And on uh, and again, identifying and confirming and ensuring that the surgery is done on the right, uh, you know, lateralization is rightly done. And usually, we know that the frontotemporal craniotomy is done uh, for these patients. And the nurse in uh, OT has a great role in uh, assisting and maintaining the aseptic techniques. Uh, so that the patient will be free of postoperative infection. So we have already seen the temporal lobe resection procedure in the previous from the previous talk. So now coming to the postoperative care, where the nurses have a major role uh, in uh, caring the patients in the ICU setting, maybe later to a ward and uh, transition to home care and uh, uh, with the uh, and discharge uh, where and. Uh, after that patient may have to continue, may have to continue their care at home and with a strict follow-up. Uh, so here the role involves preparing the post-operative unit, receiving the patient in ICU, and uh, when the patient comes, receive the patient and in initial stabilization with uh, the nurse has to have the short-term care priorities, intermediate prior care priorities, and long-term care priorities. 
So we know that how to prepare a post-operative unit. So I don't have to detail about it, but if the patient is not reversed, if there are due to any uh, intrasurgical event, the patient continue to require a mechanical ventilation that has to be arranged and kept ready with the help of, in collaboration with neuroanesthetist in the neurosurgery ICU. So when we receive the patient in ICU, we need to take a proper over from the OT team which is very, very important uh, to know about any blood loss, any kind of, uh, you know, uh, major events happen during the surgery. We need to look for any intraoperative event or any kind of um, complications that developed and then connect the patient to ventilator if applicable or uh, if not, uh, start with oxygen therapy by mask. Connect IV fluids, shift the patient to the post op bed, connect to the cardiac monitor, assess the surgical site, and secure the drains. Uh, make sure that the surgical site is dry and position the patient with 30 degree head and elevation without any neck or, neck or acute hip flexion to, uh, to prevent LA raising of IA intracranial pressure. So uh, initial, after receiving the patient, we need to initially stabilize the patient by, where the main focus is, the primary focus is obviously ABC. You need to administer oxygen, uh, oxygen or we need to provide a proper mechanical ventilator setting and uh, maybe immediate weaning off or extubation or that according to the discussion with the neurosurgeon or the neuroanesthetist, we need to decide and we need to go ahead and patients SpO2 and clinical uh, SpO2 and uh, patient that need to be clinically monitored for any respiratory depression or any complications and uh, continuous cardiac monitoring is required to understand the pulse rate and BP of the patient and the special attention to prevent and manage any hypertension because that can result in intracranial hemorrhage postoperatively and IV fluids should be required uh, for the patient and uh, monitor GCS, pupillary reaction and muscle strength, which is very, very important. We'll come see the details later. Monitor pain, monitor other signs of increased ICP and provide calm environment. And we need to administer the post-operative medication, which include a steroid to reduce the brain edema and inflammation and antibiotic, analgesics, PPA or H2 blocker and anti-epileptics. Uh, and uh, send blood samples for routine lab investigations like blood sugar and electrolytes, uh, HB, etc. And prepare a seizures monitoring chart uh, so that we can, if, if in the event of any seizures that's happening to the patient post, though they are not having high risk of any seizures during the post-operative period, as compared to any other post-craniotomy post patients, still in the event of a patient developing a seizures, we can use a seizures monitoring chart. So after initially stabilizing the patient, the nurse must monitor uh, and provide continuous monitoring and constant care to the patient. So which include, um, there's, a, uh, there's an article by, uh, given by Bose et al, which includes post-operative care of neurosurgical patients, general principles, uh, majority of the points are taken from there. And based on my experience, I have uh, compiled this. I have experience of caring the post-epilepsy uh, surgery patients when I was working as a nursing officer in uh, Ames, New Delhi, in neurosurgery ICU, where frequent epilepsy surgeries were done during the period of 2000 uh, up to 2010. And then now in our center, uh, yeah, a oh, few patients are getting operated uh, since uh, last a decade, but not very common. So uh, vitals and ABC need to be monitored because we know that there's a bi-directional relationship between the intracranial status, intracranial pressure and the vitals. Uh, the deterioration in the vitals affect the brain uh, in terms of reduced cerebral blood flow and oxygenation. And if the ICP is raised due to any reason, which can also be manifested in vitals through uh, Cushing triad, et cetera. And continuous cardiac monitoring is mandatory. And the neurological status is very important to identify any increase in edema or the intracranial hemorrhage of any event of increased ICP, which includes Glasgow Coma Scale, which, uh, which, is, uh, which must be known by every nurse, and pupillary reaction and muscle strength assessment and CN's nerve, especially third and fourth, because the palsy can be a complication uh, after the surgery. Then it has to be monitored every 20 minutes for the first two hours, 30 minutes for the next two hours, and early thereafter. And after patients are re returning to the general ward, maybe initially, because during the uh, 
And during the process of shifting the patient, um, the, it's often reported that the patient can uh, deteriorate. So initially for the half hourly and then hourly or two hourly de thereafter, depending on the patient. And pain assessment and surgical site and drain assessment uh, include, uh, are included in the ongoing monitoring. So if any change, especially in the vitals and the neurological status, pain status, because this all can be uh, cause further complication in the patient, if the pain is not well managed, can raise the ICP. So inform immediately any kind of these issues are taking place and uh, that need to be managed. As I told, the seizures monitoring chart can be this an example where the time, type of the seizures, the part involved, duration of the seizures, action taken and medication given, uh, or the medication given and uh, the initial, most, uh, this is maintained by the nurses because nurses are the one who is always uh, 24 by seven with the patient. So in, in the event of seizures, it has to be immediately in, reported. And, uh, so after the, these are the things we need to monitor and being a nurse, we must know the short term care priorities after post epilepsy surgery. So again, uh, the maintain ABC, maintain cerebral perfusion for pressure and cerebral blood flow, pain management, wound care, care of drain, seizures precautions, nutrition elimination, prevent and manage complications and neuro rehabilitation. We'll see each in detail. So coming to the airway and breathing, so there's a bi-directional relationship between with brain function and vitals and hypertension risk intracerebral hemorrhage. So we need to look for any respiratory or cardiovascular complications. Continuous cardiac monitoring is re required. We know from mechanical ventilator if the patient is intubated, otherwise oxygen administration based on the need and gradually we can wean, it, wean off from that too. Provide calm environment, pain management is very important. And uh, assess previous history of hypertension, respiratory illness, etc. Inform any changes in this uh, vitals. And next, uh, the main important is maintain cerebral tissue perfusion, cerebral perfusion, and uh, cerebral blood flow because you know that the cerebral, cerebral blood flow depends on the cerebral perfusion, where ICP plays a key uh, role in that. ICP may arise due to edema, postoperative intracranial hemorrhage. So monitor sign of raised ICP, like headache, nausea, vomiting, level of consciousness, uh, deterioration in the level of consciousness. As I already told, GCS people reaction and muscle strength and uh, has need to be monitored. Administer steroids as prescribed to reduce edema, elevate head end of the bed and avoid neck and hip flexion, provide calm environment. Uh, prevention of nausea and vomiting is also important, prevent constipation and valsalva maneuver. And coming to the pain management, uh, we have conducted a study uh, and uh, it was in that it was reported that the patients of uh, craniotomy, like in this we know that the frontotemporal craniotomy is done, patients undergo like uh, mild to moderate pain and the maximum pain is uh, between 13 to 24 hours. So uh, severe pain also may be reported because the muscle uh, dissection in the surgery is slightly less. But as there is a myth that there's no pain after craniotomy is really not true, they can experience even sometime after severe, but usually mild to moderate. And they, which is often treated in a, inadequately with the belief that there is no pain. So we can go for pharmacological or non-pharmacological pain, manage, pain management and pain need to be monitored in this patient using appropriate scales such as numerical rating scale. And wound care and infection prevention is another important aspect. So uh, like when we talk about the periorbital edema or ecchymosis following the surgery, we can apply cold application or cryotherapy. There was a study which we had conducted using the cold package, pack, yes, packs on the uh, periorbital edema where the edema is there. And it was found that uh, it reduces the edema, which can be slightly painful for the patient. And also the patient can have discomfort and fear related to this. They feel that, oh, this is like my eyes have gone. So the nurse has a great role in making them to understand it's a matter of five to seven days and the patient will be all right with the, the periorbital edema will be subsided. Then monitor surgical site and drain, uh, observe the wound dressing for any soakage or anything, we make sure that the drain is placed properly at the level of the uh, ventricles and monitor healing stage of the wound, ensure no negative pressure is applied within the drainage pack. 
monitor the drain amount and placement. We need to ensure that strict infection control measures are done by all the healthcare providers. Uh, and again, if the drain need to be emptied, usually the drain is being removed next day morning in case it need to be continued. Uh, if the drain need to be, uh, you know, emptied, uh, strict aseptic measures need to be used. And uh, extended course of antibiotic can be given in case of intraoperative brain mapping. The patient has undergone or device implantation such as VNS or uh, RNS or DPS. Uh, there are there's some of the studies shows that there is higher rate of infection in these patients. And we need to also focus on the chest wound in VNS and DPS. And uh, we need to ensure that we clamp the drain if uh, we are shifting the patient or uh, and also releasing the patient after shifting the patient from bed to trolley or for a procedure or anything. So appropriate wound scale can be used to monitor the uh, healing stage status and any infection rate in the wound. So we also need to make sure that the blood sugar, extreme blood sugar, glucose may influence neurological outcome that we all know that. So it is important for us to monitor the electrolytes and the blood sugar. And blood sugar can be also raised when this patient is on steroids. So keep them within the normal limit. And seizures prevention and management. So we'll cont usually continue the anti-epileptic uh, whichever the patient was already taken, addition of aid in case of status or breakthrough the seizures, and monitor seizures if the patient is getting any type of seizures. For that, the nurse should have certain knowledge about the type of seizures the patient was getting before um, uh, surgery, and uh, so that the nurses can observe uh, uh, more vigilantly. And safety measures are required if the patient is having uh, getting seizures and if, um, any event of seizures. Other care include nutrition, elimination, need-based uh, anti-thromboembolic measures, the patient's um, admission, I mean, the patient recovery takes more time, and hygiene needs to be maintained, again, to prevent infection and to en enhance the comfort of the patient. So intermediate care priorities include continue the respiratory hygiene uh, so that the patient uh, doesn't develop any pneumonia or any kind of patient has a good respiratory status, and attainment of total oral diet is very important so that uh, the, uh, the recovery and the outcome will be better. Early ambulation, CCS prevention strategies, which we already discussed, early transfer to ward and discharge, neuropsychological assessment. In the, maybe in the, uh, the, as a nurse at the bedside, or in, uh, epilepsy, uh, here the epilepsy nurse can play a key role in neuropsychological assessment and provide brief uh, structured counseling. So for example, we have a neurosurgery nurse counselor in our institute. Uh, they're not mainly for epilepsy only, but it was uh, in the, all the patients were operated under neurosurgery. Uh, we will be assessing the emotional and behavioral and um, training needs and the neuropsychological assessment and brief uh, counseling is given uh, to the patients and their caregivers uh, our distress also is being assessed and care is being provided, counseling is be being provided, and further she may refer the patient to even to the neuropsychologist. So we have the neurosurgery nurse counsel in our setting, also run a nurse-led clinic where the patients are assessed during the follow-up. So initiate rehabilitation like neuropsychological rehabilitation, cognitive behavioral rehabilitation, depending on the post-operative assessment, we can include the neuropsychologist for that purpose. So the care priorities for long term include, it takes months to years to become seizures free that patients have to understand, we healthcare providers also must understand. Uh, we need to uh, ensure on anti seizures measures, uh, like anti-epileptic drugs to continue, taper and mean off based on the follow-up uh, so strict follow-up is very important so that the patients will be on drug compliance and um, a proper treatment. Um, and patient can have post-operative post perineotomy headache and fatigue maybe for a few more months and uh, that need to be assessed and, um, and measures to be taken to reduce that so that the patient can get back to their activities of daily living and uh, quality of life can be improved. Routine ADL after patients can uh, go back to routine activities of daily living after four to six weeks, depend on cognitive function also, help them to accept the new normal and consider the social impact of epilepsy in their life. And the uh, rest of the care priorities uh, for long-term include neuropsychological and cognitive rehabilitation, patient education, lifestyle changes, depending on the epilepsy, what they have, family support and is very, very important. We have to train the families, 
like uh, especially regarding the costs of their uh, you know like uh, for them to become seizures free or uh, reduction in drug therapy and their activities and uh, how to support and speech therapy can be given to patients who are having speech deficits and occupational therapy can be given to patients those patients who are having more cognitive problems or post operative complications so the surgical outcome as per this literature the goal of epilepsy surgery is to decrease the number of seizures its severity of seizures ideally to though ideally to become seizure free so as per the literature up to 50% of people who undergo neuromodulation surgeries may experience better control of their seizures between 50 to 80% of the people who have resection surgery or a hemispherectomy may experience significant improvement in seizures control and in some cases become seizure free even if this is they don't become seizure free certainly they can go ahead with a lower dose of aeds a greater chance of returning to work and driving reduced the risk of life threatening complications which they were experiencing before uh, such as sudden unexplained epilepsy and death and status etc a lower risk of depression and anxiety and other neurological symptoms so uh, we need to also consider the aeds and seizures control they need to continue the same aeds uh, until there are some other uh, type of seizures of course change if required or in case of breakthrough seizures Uh, reduced or discontinued use of AEDs based on the studies show that polytherapy has de been decreased from 78 percentage before surgery to 14 percentage postoperatively. Medication was discontinued in 44 percentage of the patients. Early reduction from polytherapy to monotherapy can often be carried out in the immediate postoperative period, but the most appropriate timing of cessation or stopping of AED treatment has yet to be determined. so extra temporal resections and other forms of surgeries are not as, uh, as reduced control not uh, they are not recommended for stopping uh, they do not recommend stopping aeds prior to one year after surgery that can only be considered after one year so even studies show that up to 66 percentage of ten, uh, uh, class 1 outcome based on angel outcome scale uh, so that is free or free of disabling seizures after 10 years of 10 years after the surgery the common post operative complications can be immediate post op which can be gi related hemorrhagic edema focal neurological deficit surgical site infection and other healthcare acquired infection delayed can be cognitive sequelae visual defects defects and double vision due to third or fourth um, i mean uh, fourth uh, you know the cranial nerve involvement speech deficits or other hemiparesis or other fnds due to uh, you know uh, uh, medial uh, explore uh, internal involvement of the internal capsule and psychological uh, sequelae can be there and uh, the commonest are hemiplegia third and fourth nerve cranial plus these are the one which are reported visual field defects language disturbances memory disturbances and uh, they need to continue aids post operatively switch site infections etc so uh, we were just talking about the role of epilepsy nurses there was a study conducted in india that is in aims um the role of epilepsy nurses that is that was not on post of uh, post epilepsy surgery but that was for the epilepsy so there's an epilepsy nurse working in aims delhi who uh, is involved in uh, mainly in uh, patients who are visiting the opd for uh, to uh, identify their training needs and uh, to identify the training needs and mainly educating mainly on drug complaints and the complex and uh, the management of the drug complications and uh, to enhance the uh, you know the follow up and uh, during covid and even after the covid the technologies and um, you know were also used to uh, monitor the patients uh, during the follow up phase and the, the study which was conducted was like when the patients are coming follow up if a neurologist assess the patient's type of seizures and the like uh, and the if a nurse assess and uh, if you can modify the drug therapy so Oh, there was a good consensus between the assessment done by the epilepsy nurse and the neurologist and uh, based on that if the so the assessment time can be saved by the 
uh, neurologist in that case, and the decision of about the drug can be made by the neurologist in discussion with the neuro uh, epilepsy nurse. Uh, so um, th this part is exactly not, not not going on there, though the study was conducted. So we had conducted a study. So in 2015, it showed that the nurse uh, patients and the caregivers have poor knowledge and even a lot of myths and uh, poor attitude among the patients and caregivers related to epilepsy. So an epilepsy nurse uh, will have a great role in preoperative counseling, postoperative care planning and monitoring uh, because uh, the nurses who are uh, in ICU may require some support uh, and nurse-led rehabilitation during follow-up. Uh, that's also important. So being a nurse, uh, so in our clinic, as we told, the epilepsy nurse can assess the uh, neuropsychological status and the physical disabilities, drug complaints, and other identify other training needs. We can develop need identification checklist for the patients based on all these needs. And uh, we can assess the patient and based on that tailored interventions can be given to them, which can really change, um, uh, bring change in the, uh, you know, the practice, uh, care practices, uh, home care practices of the patients with epilepsy, uh, in improving the drug complaints and reducing the complications, and uh, uh, that obviously we know that can prevent further status or breakthroughs in SIRS. Yeah, to conclude. So epilepsy surgery is a procedure that removes an area of the brain where seizures occur. Epilepsy surgery is most effective when seizures always occur in a single location of the brain. Epilepsy surgery is not the first line of treatment, but it might be an option when at least two, two, two anti-seizures medicines have failed to control seizures. And definitely based on the literature and the patient experience, we are certain that epilepsy surgery plays a key role in, in improving in reducing the number of seizures, the severity of seizures, uh, to and uh, to you know enhance the the reduce the polytherapy to improve the quality of life and enhance the activities of daily living. So as nurses, also we must be playing key role in each and every phase of uh, managing the patients in the uh, uh, patients who are undergoing epilepsy surgery. Thank you so much. Once again, I would like to congratulate the ACNM team and uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Menju. Uh, you gave us uh, such an uh, excellent and wonderful presentation about the post epilepsy surgery care from nursing perspective. Uh, thank you. Uh, Professor Alexander, could you give us some comments and suggestions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dandapani. Thank you very much for excellent lecture. You are very experienced at lecture. It's, uh, so, so excellent. You covered all the aspects of post-operative. There is nothing to add to, to complement anything. Thank you very much. But um, I would uh, maybe a little bit uh, emphasize uh, the idea of uh, role, role of um, nurses in the in the a multidisciplinary team which takes care about the patient before surgery in time of surgery and after surgery and uh, uh, I think that there is a sense uh, actually in the fi in the final of your lecture you started to, to, to uh, discuss the preoperative uh, aspects of the surgery so the perioperative um, care of the patients is, I think, more correct, uh, uh, more correct name of your lecture because the period because before in, in, and, and after, and really, really, uh, role of um, uh, nurse uh, during this process before and after surgery, especially before um, uh, the the nurse is the person who contact permanently with the. Uh, uh, anxious patient, he 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 has some fear. He's uh, he's expecting improvement. Improvement. So, um, actually, the, all the epileptic uh, patients they diff difficult uh, emotionally. They have emotional disorders due to their main uh, uh, main disease and. Uh, the role of uh, um, a nurse is uh, very much psychological to get to have a contact with a patient to calm him down to prepare to the surgery and uh, to give him uh, some uh, some hope for the good 
result. And after surgery, of course, you covered everything. I, I can there's nothing to add. So thank you very much. Thanks, and uh, thank, thank you, you for, for this. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Professor Alexander. Uh, Professor Juji, could you give us some questions or comments? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Actually, uh, thank you, Dr. Manji, about your le uh, lecture. I enjoyed your lecture very much. Uh, it was thank very uh, comprehensive and educational. And actually, I don't have any questions. Or, uh, but the, uh, I understand India is a very young country and a very rapid growing country. And uh, so I hopefully the in India, the young spe young epilepsy specialists like you will increase and in, uh, taking care of uh, your vast, vast population. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Jujit. Uh, next, uh, I will introduce next speaker. Please let me share my screen. Uh, could you see my screen now? Yeah, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, next, uh, next speaker is Renu Kamari. Uh, she is a, a bachelor master, a bachelor degree of nursing, master degree of nursing and she has a certificate a course in palliative care, NIST certification. Her research focuses on post-hand and spine injury rehabilitation and neurism. Uh, her designation is a neurosurgery nurse counselor <laughs> in uh, pajama. She has uh, won the first rank in a master degree in uh, nurse, um, Master degree of nursing, the second prize in scientific paper by SINN 2014, the first prize in quiz by SINN, and the second prize in scientific paper, and the uh, uh, consolation prize in scientific paper. Uh, she has total 11 years of uh, work experience uh, in uh, as a staff nurse in emergency ward of neurosurgery ICU and the neurosurgery nurse counselor for the uh, last four years. She has um, published uh, uh, in several national and international journals, and she has been invited as speakers and faculty in six national conferences. She also organized uh, conferences and webinars uh, on the national level. Uh, uh, today, her topic is care of patients of epilepsy, a case report. Uh, welcome, Renu. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for such a nice and wonderful introduction. So uh, today, I'm going to present a case report on a patient with epilepsy surgery. Is it visible, ma'am? No, not yet. Uh, is it visible? No, not yet. Okay. Yes. Is it there? Yes. Yes. Okay. So first I'll start with the biodata of the patient. My patient is 22 years old, young male and he study up to 12th class. He is a pharma by occupation, 10,000 per month is his income. His date of admission for surgery to our institute is uh, 11, uh, 11th uh, December 22. And he was diagnosed as left mutual temporal lobe epilepsy and surgery which was done as left anterior temporal lobectomy with hippocampectomy. Uh, so he's 22 years old male. Uh, he was in his usual state of health until 2017 when he firstly has his uh, first seizure with impaired awareness lasting for 10 to 15 minutes while traveling in the bus. This was not associated with any involuntary movements, loss of uh, consciousness, any droop attacks, bladder and bowel uh, incontinence or frothing, etc. 
and second time he was found lying in the confused state approximately for 10 minutes uh, uh with the tea spilled over his thigh and upper limbs for which he went to the local hospital and there they prescribed him a point 100 mg bt six months into the symptom when he was playing in the ground he had tonic seizure that is the po tonic posturing of all the four limbs with rolling up of the eyes frothing bladder incontinence lasting for 25 minutes with post ictal confusion of 30 minutes even on treatment uh, he had episodes of uh, behavioral arrest lasting 4 to 5 minutes and that is the frequency is 4 to 5 per month in april 2018 one month later he had switched the medications to carbamazepine 200 mg bd uh, view in view of no improvement in may 2018 cbz it is increased to 2 uh, 300 mg bd uh, in 2018 throughout the seizures continue with the behavioral arrest with 4 to 5 uh, episodes per month by february 2019 he was on um, CBZ 300 mg BD, topiramate 25 mg, levipil 750 mg BD. In March 2019, he visited PGI. Although his EEG was normal, but uh, taking in account the seizure episodes in the form of transitly impaired awareness, deviation to the left, uh, and the speech arrest lasting for 30 seconds, and the frequency is three per month. So the doses were increased. That is, carbamazepine it was increased to 400 mg BD, topiramate 25 mg OD. and clobazem is added as 10 mg bd in april 20, 2020 he again started uh, with the same that is 300 mg bd and the clobazem is increased to 20 mg as the seizures were not controlled with these drugs also though throughout the duration the semiology of the epi episodes remained the same that is a behavioral arrest lasting for 2 to 3 minutes with uh, automatism now the current frequency is 1 to 2 episode per month and last episode was 4 days before the surgery when he came to uh pj for the surgery uh so this is a small video of the patient how this happens this is when he was working in the fields so this is the small video the past history of my patient that is uh, no no significant any past history personal history is also not significant birth and development history as we go that is a he is born by a normal vaginal de delivery and at term without any complications no developmental delay with the scholastic uh, performance is a average student family history is nothing significant no history of seizures vital signs on examination is normal he is not having any paler ictus Cyanosis, lymphadenopathy is all uh, negative in this patient. GCS is E4, V5, M6. On coming to the systemic uh, examination, central venous system it is normal. GI system there is no changes in that. In central nervous system he is left-handed. His uh, mini mental status examination is 30 by 30, and Montreal cognition assessment was done, and it was also 30 by 30. The cranial nerves they are uh, normal. and is normal both direct and indirect light reflex they are present all the cranial nerves are they are normal sensory and cerebellar functions are normal in systemic uh, uh, next is motor system examination bulk is there is no wasting normal muscle tone is there power is 5 by 5 in all the four limbs and reflexes are also normal these are the inves investigation which are done in the patient during the uh, admission uh, in the ward these are also normal all the blood in uh, investigation electrolyte investigations rft uh, tft everything is done in this patient it is normal it is in the normal range this is a video eeg which shows the left temporal ictal onset uh, in the patient which was done earlier uh, during his phase from 2019 till this time mri scan is done which shows the reduced bulk of the body tail of the left hippocampus with diffusely increased signal on flare features are likely to be it is showing the left mtls 
means the temporal uh, lobe seizure so the now the brain uh, fdg pet is done which shows the reduced flare uh, fdg uptake in the left hippocampal mesial and later cortices other investigation which are done is the normal uh, blood culture urine culture hiv hps nt hcv all the react, all these are non reactive serum pro, pro calcitonin is done and visual field is normal in the patient so neuropsychological assessment is done in the patient and uh, it shows average iq in the patient his attention language skill and visual spatial skills are adequate memory immediate recall and delayed recall ability impaired visual memory shows able to copy the figure but the quality of drawing is very poor impairment present in the semantic fluency and the phonemic fluency this neuropsychological assessment is done by the neuropsychologist in our institute uh this is done before a uh, surgery during his course of action it is done so the course and the management in the uh, ward he is 22 years boy with drug refractory left temporal lobe epilepsy he was admitted for the surgery he went left temporal anterior temporal lobectomy with hippocampectomy in the post operative period he developed two uh, fever spikes for which empirical antibiotic that is zone is uh, provided to the patient and he, he became a febrile for over the next 24 hours he had no seizure recurrence in the post operative period and is being discharged in a hemodynamically stable condition on 19 december 22 that is within 3 4 days he was discharged this is the medication treatment which uh, during discharge time we have provided him that is a clobazam 10 mg per orally bd is going on carbamazepine 400 600 mg bd levipil 1 g bd lecosamide uh, 150 mg bd pcm as a painkiller 500 mg sos is given provided to the patient the tablet pento 40 mg for 5 days and we have advised him for the suture removal after 10 days in the nearby local center in pgi so the surgical pathology report of the patient shows uh, the hippocampus it shows the mesial temporal lobe sclerosis which is a main reason of the epilepsy in these patients in this patient and the neocortex it is also sent for the sampling and it shows the normal morphology so i'm not going in the detail of the epilepsy it is a disease which is characterized by the spontaneous recurrence of the unprovoked seizures epidemiology shows that approximately 5 million people are diagnosed with epilepsy every year incidence of epilepsy is 67 cases per 1 lakh per year and 20% of uh, it affect more men than the women in india the prevalence of epilepsy is 2.5 to 11.9 per 1000 population and india contributes to 10 million epileptic so these are the etiology that uh, 75% of the cause it is unknown ki why this epilepsy is occurring in this patients and some of the causes list the of the uh, 15% they are the drug and alcohol anoxia neoplasms congenital disorders trauma vascular disease and cns infections precipitating factors are there which uh, may lead to the seizures that is the particular order flashing light certain type of music fatigue sleep deprivation hypoglycemia emotional stress electrical shock febrile illness constipation certain drugs hyperventilation but nothing of the precipitating factor is present in the patient this is the pathophysiology when there is imbalance in the neurotransmitter then glutamate it increases and the gaba it decreases which lead to the epilepsy this is the mechanism for inherited epilepsy the frontal lobe epilepsy parietal lobe occipital lobe epilepsy and mesial temporal lobe epilepsy my patient is having mesial temporal lobe epilepsy so temporal lobe epilepsy it is the epilepsy that start in the temporal lobe uh, area of the brain as the name suggests temporal lobe is very important as it processes the memories and sounds interprets the vision and governs the speech and language and it also involves in the unconscious automatic responses such as hunger thirst flight or uh, fight response emotion and sexual arousal when uh, it is left uh, temporal lobe is affected then the ability to understand the language learn memorize uh, from the form uh, memorize form speech and remember verbal information it sometimes tempered in these patients in the right temporal lobe epilepsy it affects the functions such as learning memorizing norm non verbal informations like music drawing recognizing the information and determining the facial expressions 
so it is very common if it in, in the most common causes of uh, tle is hippocampal the sclerosis about 80% of the patients they have uh, the seizures starts near the hippocampus medication can successfully control the seizures in 66% of the patient and the seizures which start near the hippocampus they are successfully treated with the surgery so these are the temporal lobe epilepsy that is a mesial and neocortical mesial means in the middle or near to the uh, hippocampus so if it is starting in or near to the hippocampus it is a mesial temporal lobe uh, mesial temporal epilepsy neocortical or lateral temporal lobe epilepsy is when it start in the outer section of your temporal lobe this type of uh, tle it is very rare and most uh, commonly it occurs due to the genetic cause symptoms include staring into space or a blank stare repetitive behaviors or movement that is the automatism um, of the eyes hands and the mouth confusion unusual speech alter ability to respond and communicate with others brief loss of ability to speak read and comprehend speech so this is the uh, most common mesial temporal lobe epilepsy is the most common form of human epilepsy and anterior mesial temporal resection is the most common surgical procedure which is performed to treat the epilepsy assessment and diagnosis the most useful diagnosis tool is the patient's health history physical examination history includes the birth and development history significant illness and injuries family history febrile illness comprehensive neurological assessment is to be done in the patient seizure history is uh, include the precipitating factor any anti uh, antecedent events seizure description cbc is to be done serum electrolytes lft kft zero analysis is to be done in the patient to rule out any kind of metabolic disorders uh, these all are the tests which is done in the patient that is history taking physical examination ct scans mri and functional mri eeg video eeg pet scans spect is to be done neuropsychological assessment is done in these patients the goal of management is to prevent the injury during the seizures to eliminate the factor that precipitate seizures to diagnose and treat the cause of the seizures and to allow the desired lifestyles which a person need to have so the treatment includes the pharmacological surgical and nursing pharmacological is the line that is the aids which we include the surgical that is a resection uh, that is a resection callostomy uh, vagus nerve stimulation these are the surgical uh, things which is to be done in the patient in the management we sometime prescribe ketogenic diet to the patient that is a uh, it is very high in fat and low in carbs but this is to be done uh, actually by the dietitian and the epilepsy uh, uh, epilepsy resident so that they will carefully monitor and create this diet for the patient surgical management is cortical resection temporal lobectomy hemispherectomy and vagal nerve stimulator implantation is to be done so complication as it is already done by ma'am that is a morbidity rate in the patient hemiplegia occur in these patient third and fourth cranial nerve palsy occurs visual field defects occur language disturbances because sometimes the language area is there memory disturbances occur in these patients so nursing assessment includes the history physical and neurological examination of the patient and observation of the client during a seizure what kind of seizure what is the involvement uh, duration conscious uh, what behavior during the attack we should note all these things nursing diagnosis include the infective breathing pattern risk of injury related to the uh, seizure activity ineffective coping ineffective therapeutic regime knowledge deficit related to diagnosis risk of infection after the surgery mainly the suture site infection occurs if they don't take care of the sutures properly social isolation related to low self against the disease state anxiety related to lack of knowledge about the disease so as nurses we should be we should teach them so these are the main topics which we should diet general health of the patient fever illness environmental occupational recreational risk factors stress anxiety depression women health here before and after the seizure very very important for these patient drug compliance we should em emphasis put emphasis on the patient to be compliant with the drug because one surgery is done it doesn't mean that the he is like seizure free and he don't have to take the medicines medicine should be taken and slowly and slowly the medicines they are tapered off
thing is for the caregiver health education to the caregivers is also very important for the better quality of life of the patient as well as of the family because the caregivers are there they should also understand what uh, uh, what the things they should do for the patient and the, how much important is the drug for these patients first aid during the seizures and after the seizures we should teach to them explaining them do's and don'ts after the epileptic surgery neuropsychological rehabilitation it should start as early as possible cognitive and behavior rehabilitation once if it is found that he is having cognitive deficits this rehabilitation should be started occupation therapy is very important if we want the patient to come into the society as a normal human being we should start with all these therapies like speech therapy occupation therapy neuropsychological rehabilitation here during the seizure that is providing the previous uh, previously to the patients and uh, if uh, is a patient to the floor these all are the points we should keep in the mind and we should teach these points to the caregivers as well as to the patient also if he is alone so we he should know what to do at the time of seizure here after the seizure we should keep the patient to one side to prevent aspiration patient should be reoriented to the environment and uh, a short apneic uh, period may occur during or immediately after a generalized seizure if the patient become agitated after a seizure gentle restraint can be used for the patient patient with the epilepsy may still have the seizure and the reasons can be that is failure to take the medicine correctly variation in medication effectiveness sleep deprivation stress hypoglycemia alcohol use hormonal fluctuations flashing lights that is the triggering factors if it is there in my patient post operative changes he was operated in december only only from the last three months patient is not having any seizure which was earlier is one to two episodes per week he is doing his ads activity of daily living independently going to the fields doing little work going to the market alone there is no memory loss uh, no driving allowed till now one medication that is locasamide which is 150 mg bd is prescribed now it is uh, decreased in first follow up up to 100 mg bd in first uh, in this follow up neuropsychological assessment is to be planned in the next follow up when he will come here then we will come to know what uh, differences there are before uh, what are the differences which is there uh, before the surgery and post operatively what uh, differences we can note in his uh, uh, verbal and visual memories angel outcome scale this is uh, to find out the patient uh, outcome so this is to be done discussion this is there is like a remarkable improvement after the surgery focal cortical dysplasia and hippocampal sclerosis they are the common risk factor for the focal epilepsy so there are some of the research studies neuropsychological up, outcomes after epilepsy surgery it is a systematic review and full estimation epilepsy uh, the results show that epilepsy surgery is is associated with specific cognitive changes but may also improve cognition in some patient the result provides best rate estimates of the expected cognitive gains and losses against with epilepsy surgery that may prove useful in clinical settings long term clinical uh, long term neuropsychological neuropsychological outcome following temporal lobe epilepsy surgery so cognitive function remains stable during uh, through long term follow up despite immediate post operative post surgery decline a negative relation between the seizure control and memory impairment has emerged and a possible role of more selective surgery procedure is highlighted the long term outcomes of the post op uh, of the epilepsy surgery so this is a retrospective analysis is done so it is find that the patient who had amygdala hippocampactomy were more likely to have seizure recurrence than the patient who had an anterior temporal lobe resection and temporal lesenectomy there was no significant significant difference between extra temporal and temporal lesenectomy hippocampal sclerosis was associated with a good outcome but declined in relative frequency over the years now next is the impact of epilepsy surgery on cognition and behavior it is found that renewed focus on cognitive strategies may also be useful in planning post operative rehabilitation so cognitive uh, uh, this rehabilitation should be start as early as possible in this patients so next one is the this study which oh, sorry, this shows that positive predictors of short term outcome do not predict long term outcome in the patient with temporal lobe epi uh, epilepsy associated with hippocampus sclerosis absolute freedom of seizures and auras cannot be predicted by conventional pre operative variables 
नेक्स्ट इज टेम्पोरल टेम्पोरल लोब एपिलेप्सी विद हिपो कैंपस क्लैरोसिस प्रिडिक्टेड फॉर लॉन्ग टर्म सर्जिकल आउटकम सो इन दिस वॉट वी फाइंड इज प्रिडिक्टेड फॉर द लॉन्ग टर्म सर्जिकल रिजल्ट ऑफ टेम्पोरल लोब एपिलेप्सी विद हिपो कैंपस क्लैरोसिस आर डिफरेंट from those variables that predict the short term outcome epilepsy duration is the most important predictor for long term surgical outcome our result strongly suggests that surgery for tlehs should be performed as early as possible to get the better results uh, so in this we find in this surgery we find that seven of the patients achieved an excellent seizure outcomes five of them were totally seizure free and additional five patients have less than 75 reduction in the seizure frequency so the following pre atl factors uh, predicted an excellent outcomes antecedent history of febrile seizures strictly unilateral anterior temporal intraactal epileptiform discharges so this is a review surgery a review study thank you so much for your valuable listening thanks a lot Uh, thank you very much, Renal. You gave us such a detailed and wonderful lecture about uh, uh, the care of patient with epilepsy. Uh, it's a very interesting case report, and uh, you introduce uh, uh, the definition uh, epi uh, epidemiology and uh, 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 the assessment and diagnosis, uh, the surgery, the treatment methods. Uh, Uh, the uh, surgery, medication, and uh, nursing care for the patients with uh, epilepsy, and you also uh, give us a summary of the research in uh, care of patients of epilepsy, such as uh, 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 neuro uh, neuro co uh, cognitive uh, uh, advances uh, in patients uh, uh, undergoing epilepsy. Uh, good job! Thank you very much. Uh, Professor so much, Alexander, could you give us some comments and uh, suggestions? Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you, Dr. Professor Lee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kumari. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Kumari. Uh, thank you for and my congratulations with very good uh, presentation of case report and good literature review. So thank you, it's great. Uh, I have a question for you. Did you have a um, chance? to check uh, the concentration of uh, anti-epileptic drugs uh, in the blood serum of this patient or some other patients? No, no sir. Because done. this was the, not, the, no, sir. I understand it's uh, really quite um, expensive and not available in every country, but it's a key point uh, in uh, selection of uh, patients uh, of um, I, I had, uh, I had, that re I had resistant uh, epilepsy patients. It's a key point. So once you didn't approve the patient has a therapeutic concentration in serum blood, it's you cannot say that it's antibiotic uh, anti sorry anti epileptic drug resistant case. It was fortunately everything was very good, but uh, this is a very important point in investigation of the patient. And another, uh, what about the mesial temporal epilepsy? Uh, these cases are really uh, very good in prognosis, and I think majority of epileptic surgeons starts from uh, temporal epilepsy. But at the same at the same time, um, there is a, a lot of uh, pitfalls in management of this patient. And first pitfall. Uh, you must diagnose which hemisphere is uh, dominant in the patients. Uh, I, usually it's, uh, it's uh, left hemisphere, like in this patient. And here you have a very big danger uh, to get um, amnestic syndrome in post-operative uh, period. So usually uh, what, what a test it's uh, recommended before such a surgery when you when you work with dominant dominant hemisphere because if you once uh, had a patient with uh, total amnesia you will never do the surgery without additional testing because it's a really tragedy for the patient to have no 
memory and uh, no ability to acquire no, in no information. It's, it's a real tragedy for the patient. So that is why we always must uh, exclude the risk of uh, this uh, of this possible complication after surgery. Uh, so, uh, but and so thank you very much. So this is my comment. Thank you, so much, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Alexander. Uh, Professor Georgi, could you give us some comments or suggestions? Thank you. Okay. Uh, first, thank you, Mrs. Kumari, for your nice lecture. I, I, I enjoyed it very much. I have some questions about the uh, legal issue surrounding the uh, seizure patient in India. So uh, you briefly mentioned about driving ban on this patient, right? Yes, sir. So uh, the patient is prohibited from driving. So uh, in Japan, the seizure epilepsy patient cannot drive after the last episode of uh, seizure for at least two, two years. It's a legal, legal ban on the epilepsy patient nationally. So is in India, is any is there any uh, such legal regulation on uh, seizure patient nationally or so there are legal protocols that are also there but uh, uh, in india like so we can't uh, maximum of them they just after surgery they just have a question like we can drive we can go to the normal routine because uh, we are low, malab, low income or the persons who understand that is a thing that we should not drive. We are having seizure. We should put a card in the pocket, but there is nothing like that in in these in our scenario, especially. No patient they put any see in card in their pocket that they is having a seizure history or something like that. They go on. They they drive, sir. I don't know, mm -hmm. malab, like legally it is not there. I feel so. Okay, thank just, you. Just, just want to add uh, that uh, the, the Japanese laws and Indian laws are same. Mm -hmm. okay. No difference. Yes, only, yes, thing, only, thing India, is, only, just... only thing is that some patients, they won't reveal. Yeah, not, that's the thing. Not, yes, not, 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 not so only they don't reveal that. Yeah, not only for driving, even for marriage, even for a job, even for driving, they won't reveal because they're scared. If they reveal, they won't get married. If they reveal, they can't drive. If they reveal, they won't get a job. So they try to conceal. But that concealment leads to new problems later subsequently. Laws are strict. Monitoring is not strict. OK. Thank you. Uh, if I can add a couple of comments. Uh, sure, it, sir. Yeah. Uh, one is, in India, National institutions have taken a lead, like Sri Chitra, uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, NIMANS, PGI. And from them, the corporate hospitals uh, have collaborated and then uh, and learned and doing epilepsy surgery. I think this should happen even at the uh, at the uh, nursing uh, uh, level also. So those who are interested, for example, uh, if someone working in a corporate hospital wanted to learn should visit these national institutes and invite experienced people from the national institutes to come to their their centers see video easy intention is to provoke seizures you you want patients to have seizures and you know seizure can injure the person so a lot of uh, uh, modification of the video easy room is required there should not be any sharp metal wood which can project, which can harm, which can injure the person. All those things can be learned by collaboration. That is one point. Then the second point is, there is a group in India called NESAN. NESAN stands for National Epilepsy Surgery Support Group, NESAN group. So those with experience at all levels will teach those who do not have experience are interested to uh, learn. 
and every month uh, one or two centers will present their difficult cases how to manage these cases so the experienced people will tell that this is the way to manage and uh, i just spoke to them and then they said all of you are welcome either to join that nesson meeting every month or you can present your interesting cases the the people with experience will share that what way some problem can be solved so i'm sure uh, uh, professor yeko koto and her team will facilitate this sort of coordination among uh, the indian group and uh, other uh, uh, groups from other institutions in the world in asia thank you very much thank you very much uh, thank you sir thank, thank you for your uh, comment Uh, as a society of uh, indian neuroscience nurses i think as a team we should also take some lead in uh, initiating uh, uh, some of the guidelines and we have developed the same for stroke so uh, and rehabilitating the patients and collaborating with other centers i think uh, we will also take some lead uh, in uh, managing patients of epilepsy thank you, thank you very much thank you Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for giving me your men so that I can share my knowledge with you. Thank you so much. Let me uh, welcome Professor Kato uh, to have the closing remarks. Professor Kato. Uh, thank you very much for it. Was a really uh, the excellent uh, the session. I think. So but before uh, the close, I just I uh, want to ask uh, Dr. Rao, you know, if we are more sensei, they still remain. Uh, any suggestion to the uh, Ukraine uh, neurosurgical society because they do not have a expensive uh, machine or some. The Alexander he says. So, uh, Dr. Rao. Can you uh, have some suggestion to his society? How, uh, how we can, I, I think, we can I think I, I'll I'll correspond uh, with uh, Professor Alexander and then get more details, more information. Then I'll share the uh, same. I'll copy the emails to you. Okay. I'll go okay. to the details. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Professor Carter. Thank you, Professor Rao. Let Let us keep in touch. It will be very sure. interesting and sure. fruitful. Sure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yamos, Yamos sensei. Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, the device devices and uh, uh, neurosurgical robots are uh, expensive in this country also, and uh, it's very hard to uh, obtain these uh, devices. <clears throat> However, uh, we can we can use a conventional uh, approach uh, to any uh, uh, epilepsy. epilepsy uh, surgery then uh, <clears throat> it is not always necessary <clears throat> to uh, to buy uh, every every uh, <clears throat> equipment <laughs> uh, well uh, then uh, I, I, I I don't recommend I don't recommend everything uh, uh, maybe uh, if it if If you can, if you can buy the robot, uh, it, it, it's good, but uh, uh, not necessary, uh, not always necessary. So uh, we always uh, we always see the patients, uh, patients. Uh, uh, what, what kind of what kind of a surgery uh, do patients need? Then uh, we can. Uh, Treat patient by uh, the usual and the conventional approach, and then uh, there's no uh, 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 big big issues. Maybe uh, I hope uh, in every country in Asia, uh, the patients uh, patients with epilepsy will be happy uh, in the future. Okay. Thanks, Inama uh, Sensei. Hi. Uh... I thank Dr. Kato and other collaborators for uh, organizing such a nice meeting. So uh, through this meeting, I learned the uh, very important importance of a closer collab collaboration between doctors and nurses. And also after the uh, COVID era, people may be able to moving more closer. So maybe a 
closer relationship between countries and countries will be possible from now on. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks so much. So uh, as for the epileptic uh, treatment, of course, the surgery is the most important thing, but the recently so many drugs and also not only the neurosurgery, but also the uh, uh, <clears throat> neurology or some, uh, some other uh, session can collaborate. I, I think it's very uh, promising, uh, the field of the epilepsy is coming, I think. So uh, it is really wonderful, uh, the session. Thank you very much for shining, the organizing of the wonderful the speakers. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you. ma'am. So on behalf of ACNN, I thank Professor Kato, uh, Matt and Ichen, uh, and the India organizing team, the invited speakers, session chairs, and commentators for sharing your vast knowledge with us. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, thank you. A small announcement. We'll be having this ACNN webinar on 18th June. Please do participate and circulate the information among your colleagues to increase the participation. Uh, thank you all once again. Thank you. 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 Thank